Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove. The host of New Thinking Aloud, Jeffrey Mishlove, PhD, is also the author of The Roots of Consciousness, PSI Development Systems, and The PK Man. Between 1986 and 2002, he hosted and co-produced the original Thinking Aloud public television series and now hosts his show on his dedicated YouTube channel. He is the recipient of the only doctoral diploma in parapsychology ever awarded by an accredited university, the University of California at Berkeley, in 1980. If you study the history of events such as telepathy, people being directed in dreams in ways that save or beneficially alter their lives or give them incredible business ideas, to clairvoyance, clairaudience, psychokinesis, intuitive knowing, visitation by beings from other dimensions, astral travel, remote viewing, out-of-body experiences, or communicating with the deceased on the other side, or even UFOs, you will find that as long as human beings have been writing things down, painting, drawing, or communicating their experiences, these modes of conscious awareness and communication have been with us. Shaman are well documented from the past to the present to have one or more of these amazing abilities. Something happened along the way about the time of the Industrial Revolution and we begin to deny such things as invalid, superstitious, or worse. People who admitted such abilities are often deemed crazy or mentally dysfunctional. Yet today we have scientists like Dean Radin, Russell Targ, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and many others that have produced literally mountains of extremely high quality science scientifically validating that these kinds of abilities and skills are inherent in human consciousness. My guest today, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, actually has the only doctoral degree in parapsychology ever given in the U.S. from UC Berkeley and has spent his life investigating parapsychological phenomena and has interviewed hundreds of the best thinkers in this and other arenas related to consciousness on his past TV show, Thinking Aloud, and continues to offer a wealth of excellent information in his current New Thinking Aloud platform on YouTube. Join Jeffrey Mishlov and I for a wild ride into the world of parapsychology and get ready to hear some absolutely amazing parapsychological events that he's witnessed personally, along with entire cities like San Francisco and London, England, witnessing these things. You are also sure to find his work as a researcher for one of the CIA's investigative teams very interesting indeed. I hope you enjoy my deep and meaningful dialogue with Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, one of the world's most highly regarded and respected parapsychologists and educators. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I am very excited about today's guest, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove. Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove is a parapsychologist, and and, uh, I'm going to let him tell you a, a very interesting story about that and how he got his degree. Uh, when we get going, but I wanted to share with you one. I absolutely love Dr. Mishlove. I have been watching his show Thinking Aloud for a long time, and I turned my client, Jason Picard, who's my longest running client, on to Thinking Aloud, and he loved it. And as a gift one year, Dr. Mishlove, Jason bought me every single DVD you guys sell of all your prior TV shows, and it came in two great big boxes. So I don't know how many shows that is, do you? (laughs) Uh, It's probably about 200. Yeah, and I spent probably a few years watching one or two of those shows every night when I came home from work, and I probably have bought $10,000 worth of books from all the guests you've had on there and read tons of them. And um, I just absolutely love your show. I, I love you. I love your interviews, your, the way you get the most out of people, the depth of your own knowledge. And I love your new site, New Thinking Aloud on YouTube. You have a lot of fantastic speakers and guests on there on a wide variety of very interesting topics, For at least for me, that's for sure. So. I'm super excited to have you here, and I just want to start by saying thank you so much, Dr. Mishlove, for all that you have given the world. My God, you have been a constant outpouring. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, 
Also, I want to mention up front, Dr. Mishlove has three books, The Roots of Consciousness, The PK Man, PK meaning Psy, psy right, Dr. Mishlove? Psychokinesis. Psychokinesis and Psy Development Systems. As, as, are there any other books I've missed? Well, there's an anthology of uh, early interviews from the Thinking Aloud series. Uh, it's called Thinking Aloud. Okay, uh, great. Mm-hmm. Well, it's quite um, impressive and amazing that you hold the only doctoral diploma in parapsychology from UC Berkeley. Um, I know you've been involved in parapsychology and consciousness research for quite some time. Could you share how, uh, just an overview of your background and what led you to parapsychology and tell us about, tell us the story about your doctorate degree. I heard you meant talk about that in, in an interview at some point, but I think that's a pretty interesting story. So if, if you don't mind, just sort of let us know how Jeffrey Mishlove became Jeffrey Mishlove and got into parapsychology. Okay. Well, I was a child of the 60s. I I started my undergraduate years at the University of Wisconsin in 1965, and I majored in psychology. I did a senior honors thesis on the psychology of religious mysticism. Ooh, can I have a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to read that. <laughs> well, I started out as a skeptic, really. I figured I'd, I'd be looking at uh, people who report mystical experiences and they see ghosts. And I figured I'd probably be writing about what form of psychopathology this was. But uh, the more I began investigating it, I uh, learned from just reading the literature, uh, for example, Abraham Maslow's work in psychology, that uh, people who report mystical experiences are amongst the highest functioning people in society. And uh, he called them peak experiences. And he, he found that people like Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt were reporting these experiences. And at the same time, being a child of the 60s, I was taking... Uh, marijuana and psychedelic drugs, and I began having these experiences of my own. And and they seemed very positive to me at the time. They didn't seem pathological. It was as if new vistas were opening up, and and I was curious about it. Uh, But then I went to graduate school in Berkeley. I started out in criminology uh, because they had a clinical psychology track there, and that was my interest. I was doing uh, group therapy at San Quentin Prison with rapists and murderers. And uh, at the same time, I was feeling like uh, this wasn't right for me, that I really wanted to begin to explore the positive side of human deviance, not the negative side. <laughs> so I, I agonized over this for months. You know, at a school like a great university like Berkeley, you, you could study psychopathology and crime and social alienation of, of every kind. But if you wanted to study creativity, intuition, uh, mysticism, and, and psychic functioning, there were no programs. Uh, so I didn't know what to do. And one day, I had a a dream. After months of agonizing, I knew that I was going to have an answer to my search in a dream. And that night, I did. I had a very vivid dream. And I woke up from the dream at 7 in the morning with this feeling of eureka. I found it, but I didn't know what it meant. (laughs) And, And in the dream... I was visiting my friends, Peter and Marcy Hartman, who lived across town. It's married student housing in Berkeley. And I knocked on their door in the dream and nobody was home. And in the dream, I found a key. I let myself into their apartment, walked into the living room and found a magazine in the middle of the living room floor. And in the dream, the magazine was called I, E-Y-E. 
And I was paging through it in my dream when I woke up with this feeling of exhilaration. And all I could think of is I better go over to that apartment and find that magazine. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so I, I put on my tennis shoes. Uh, this was even in the days before they had running shoes. And I ran across Berkeley five miles. I got to this apartment. I knocked on the door early in the morning, but nobody was home as I had dreamt. And in fact, I happened to know that they left a key under the doormat. So I found the key, let myself into their apartment, walked into the living room, and there, smack dab in the middle of the living room floor, just as I had dreamt, was a magazine. Uh, Only it wasn't called I-E-Y-E, it was called Focus. And I began paging through it. It was the magazine of listener-sponsored radio and television, KQED, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And as I paged through that magazine, it dawned on me for the first time in my life that I might be able to pursue my interests by getting involved in non-profit listener-sponsored media. Uh, which was a strange thought for me to have back then, because in those days, I was a long-haired hippie. I did not own a radio or a TV. And even more, I didn't believe in electronic communication. I thought it was all phony baloney, that the only authentic interactions were face-to-face. So uh, I changed my mind at that moment, and I went over to the listener-sponsored radio station in Berkeley, KPFA, a Pacifica station, and I said, I'd like to volunteer. And at the time, I had just earned my master's degree in criminology. And uh, they said, sure, sit at this desk, and when you hear the doorbell ring, push this button and let people in the front door. That was my first (laughs) job there, which I happily took. And and within three weeks, I had learned how to produce a radio program. I did a program on, uh, you don't have to be from out of town to be psychic. I did a program interviewing a lot of my local friends who were members of uh, various pagan communities and were psychic. And The program director liked it so much that he said they had a regular slot for me every Tuesday and Thursday in uh, at noon. And so all of a sudden, uh, the program was called The Mind's Ear. I found myself sitting across the table with world-class experts. Everyone who was on a book tour passing through San Francisco would stop at KPFA, and I'd be interviewing them with 10,000 people listening in on all of my favorite subjects. And that gave me the confidence then, since I was still enrolled at the university, to go and create an individual interdisciplinary doctoral major in parapsychology following certain rules that were available for graduate students in good standing if you want to do a dissertation on a topic that no single department can sponsor, but you can find professors in different departments who will sponsor you. So so that's what I did. And I was in that program from 1973 until 1980 when I graduated. It took seven years. That's amazing. What a beautiful story. And and uh, what what a how fitting for a man seeking the previously unavailable degree in para parapsychology to end up being guided to it parapsychologically. Yeah, I felt like my life has been guided by dreams and synchronicities ever since then. Not that it's always been smooth, far from it, because the the closer I got to earning the degree, the more and more obstacles were thrown at me. And even after I got the degree, there are skeptics who, who, who believe that major universities should never award degrees in parapsychology, and they put a lot of pressure on the university to try and revoke my degree. When they failed at revoking the degree, they actually arranged to have an article published in a major magazine claiming that I didn't really get it. 
uh, or if I did get it, I didn't deserve it. And I ended up having to fight a libel suit for six years. Oh, my God. Well, isn't that just the perfect lead in to my next question? But I don't want to stop you from sharing what else you might want to share. But that that that's, you know, unfortunately, not a lot of that behavior has changed, has it? Well, uh, no, as a matter of fact, there, even though the findings of parapsychology are, are as strong as ever, and the American Psychological Association, which has always been hostile and skeptical towards parapsychology, just two years ago to the month, published a major article summarizing all of uh, the data that parapsychologists had accumulated over 1,300 experiments over the years with a very good research methodology and highly significant results. Uh, But a lot of people, the skeptics in particular, don't read that. Uh, literature, even if they're professional psychologists. So they go along uh, acting as if the data never existed. It's sad. Yes. You know, my next question is, is uh, basically human beings have been having experiences that are clearly within the domain of parapsychology for as long as there are written records. And almost all religious books are full of them. I mean, <laughs> Moses and the burning bush. Uh, Muhammad meeting with an angel and recording the Quran. And it seems to me that uh, with Rene Descartes and the resulting split between the church and science, we, esp- uh, we essentially split the human psyche into two camps that just for loose ca- categorization, I would describe as the left brain, rational, logical, scientific materialist. If you can't weigh it and measure it, it doesn't exist. And the right brain dominant spiritual or religious types Could you give us an overview of human parapsychological experiences and what led to the disdain and denial of parapsychological realities that we're discussing right now? Well, you know, given those two domains that you've just enunciated, parapsychology is a bridge between the two. Basically, parapsychologists are committed to the empirical methods of science, but we're saying we can use those methods to show that there is more than the conventional idea of a material reality, that there are realities that are not... it, you can't explain from the point of view materialism. And, and, and the irony is you can't even explain normal consciousness uh, from a materialistic perspective, let alone paranormal experiences. But the, the materialists hope and believe that eventually they'll be able to explain normal consciousness. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. It's only hard because if you believe that you start with dead inert matter, how do you get consciousness out of that? That's the uh, puzzle no one's been able to solve after hundreds of years of trying. If you start from the premise that, uh, as the great physicist Max Planck, the founder of quantum physics, said that consciousness is fundamental. If you start with consciousness, then the findings of parapsychology uh, are natural and normal, as well as normal consciousness. Hello, everybody. If you're interested in making a real difference in the world by healing yourself and others, you might want to hear more about our Czech Academy program. What is the Czech Academy? Well, it's the result of over 30 years of hard work and research designed to help you become a holistic health and performance professional through my distinctive, integrative approach. The Academy covers everything you need to know, including diet, functional anatomy, exercise, stress reduction, coaching, personal success, and spiritual attunement, and it's the most effective way to learn the comprehensive and corrective techniques I've cultivated throughout my career. That's because the Academy goes beyond offering my courses and advanced training programs. It offers you group mentoring, online workshops offered nowhere else on coaching and business skills, like the best way to set up your rates, peer support and accountability, and so much more. And it really works. There are Czech trained professionals all around the world with varying backgrounds from bartenders to surgeons to truck drivers. 
The Czech Academy is designed to transform anybody, regardless of their background, into a successful holistic health practitioner. In fact, over 40% of our students have no prior health and fitness training. The only things you need are an open mind and a desire to learn. It's affordable, too. Instead of paying tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars on expensive conventional education on nutrition, kinesiology, the science of effective coaching, and related sciences, you can attend the Czech Academy for as low as $372 a month, and that includes everything you need. If you use what you learn in the Academy, you can easily make that much money in a single day, and it's not unusual for our top Czech professionals to make as much as $350 an hour. Being good at what you do and loving it is the best means of ensuring an excellent income regardless of the state of the economy. If mastering holistic health, enhancing athletes' performance, and being a healing influence in the world interests you, visit checkinstitute.com forward slash academy. That's C-H-E-K institute dot com forward slash academy, all lowercase, and get your application in. You can also set up a free consultation with one of our career advisors to learn more. Applications are open until the end of October or until we reach full capacity, so enrollments will happen on a limited first-come, first-served basis. I hope to see you in the Academy this year. Lots of love. You know, also, Einstein said... The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. And it's interesting because he's a hero to most of these scientific materialists, but they aren't paying attention to what he's saying in many regards. Well, when I was young, people told me that uh, there were maybe 12 people in the world who could even understand Einstein. Now I think there are many, many more people, but uh, the implications of Einstein's thinking are are mind-boggling. You know, the idea that if you travel at the speed of light, uh, time stops, your watch won't move. You could go from one end of the universe to another. Your twin brother here on Earth would be dead billions of years ago. And when you return, uh, you would be billions of years in the future, but it might only take you a few weeks or a few minutes. it's, it's really quite amazing. But Einstein himself had a hard time with um, parapsychology, uh, or he had mixed feelings about it. He actually wrote the introduction to a book called Mental Radio by Upton Sinclair, who was a famous novelist back in the 1930s. And he reported that his wife was very clairvoyant, and he sent the manuscript to Einstein, and Einstein was quite impressed. But at the same time, Einstein was rejecting quantum physics. And his argument against quantum physics is interesting. He, he did a thought experiment with two colleagues, uh, Podolsky and Rosen, in which he showed, he said, if quantum theory is true, everything is instantaneously connected. Uh, which he thought of as spooky action at a distance or telepathy between particles. And uh, therefore, he said, quantum physics must be false. And uh, while I was still in graduate school, they began doing the experiments that tested the EPR effect, as it was known as uh, for Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky. And uh, they found that the effect was correct. We now know of it as quantum entanglement, and it's well accepted. It's the basis for a lot of new thinking about quantum computers. Uh, Soon we'll have a whole new generation of computers operating at uh, enormous speeds, uh, greatly more powerful than the existing supercomputers as a result of Einstein's EPR effect. Do you know if uh, Einstein was alive when Bell created Bell's theorem and proved uh, <laughs> proved that Einstein was wrong and, and that spooky action at a distance or entanglement was in fact real and that it was non-local? Uh, if Einstein was alive, it would have been uh, very near the end of his life. Uh, I, I don't recall the exact date when he died, but I, I, the Bell's theorem, I think, uh, doesn't go back any further than, to my knowledge, than maybe the 1960s. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't remember when Einstein uh, died, but uh, it would have been another interesting experience for him to see the math on Bell's theorem and realize that this is actually happening. Yeah, he died in 1955. So it would have been, uh, I'm pretty sure, well before uh, John Bell's theorem. So where do you think this, you know, because, you know, I, I practice modern shamanism and astral travel and, and remote viewing, and I won a remote viewing contest in England. It was taught by the uh, director of the CIA's remote viewing program, and it was 750 people. And then they had a contest at the end of the training, and I won the contest. And it was quite surprising to some of my instructors that were with me because they didn't know I had those abilities. But, um, you know, these these things began happening to me when I was 12. I was in a really, really stressful environment. My father had drowned when I was eight. My parent mother got remarried to a man that was extremely violent and controlling and had no concept of children, whatever. And we worked like slaves on the farm all my childhood. It was just really like being in prison camp. But uh, I used to, he used to, they used to make us go to bed at 7.30 at night. And on Vancouver Island, where we lived on our 140 acre sheep farm, in the summertime, it doesn't get dark till 11 o'clock at night. And as you can imagine, a 12 year old kid just feels like he's completely and utterly caged after spending all day in the fields and fixing fences and shoveling pens and dot, 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 then getting locked into a bedroom. And, you know, there was no video games or any of that. I just had <laughs> me and books in an empty room. And uh, the stress was just, you know, I, I really was really hating life and I was angry at God and I was just uh, confused as to why my life was so shitty like that. And one night I fell asleep and all of a sudden I awoke, but I awoke in a, a, a body double and I was up floating over the ceiling looking down at myself and it scared the hell out of me. And I remember falling back into my body and, and as my body double came into my body that was sleeping, my whole body shook like an earthquake had hit it. And then I realized, wow, I had just left my body somehow. But I thought right away, if I could do it once, I could do it again. So I, I just kept my intention on leaving my body again. And sure enough, I was able to practice this. And I got to where I could leave my body. And then I was worried maybe I was just going nuts. So I would go look around the barnyard and I would go to places like inside the barn or I'd climb up into my tree fort and I would try to identify things that were there. And then I'd get up in the morning and sure enough, every time exactly what I saw was there. And so I realized that I could actually leave the house or my body anytime I wanted. So when my parents would lock us in the room at night, I would just do out of body travel and go all over the place. <laughs> And so, you know, I'm, I'm bringing this up because, uh, you know, I was listening to an interview with Charles Tart, and he was mentioning that surveys show that 10 to 15% of people at large have these types of experiences. And almost everybody surveyed says they've had mystical experiences in, at one point in their life or another. And if you study the history of consciousness and you look at the structure stages such as the magic and the and the mythic stage it's very very clear that we were having these kinds of experiences we were you know you study the food of the gods by terence mckenna and related books and you realize we've been using uh plant medicines or or entheogens or psychedelics for a very very long time and you study things like the history of the ulyssian mysteries and all the mystery schools and dot, dot, dot. We've been having these experiences for so long. So I'm curious, when do you feel that this rift came that all of a sudden made what was fairly normal and talked about and written about a lot taboo in a sense? Well, what a story, uh, Paul. I'm very impressed uh, by that. Let me, let me say first that uh, the fact that you had an unhappy childhood seems to be very common amongst people who report psychic experiences uh, of a spontaneous nature 
uh, such as such as you had that that kind of a childhood uh, seems to engender these experiences. And I think it has something to do with the idea that the external physical environment is is threatening and dangerous and uncomfortable. So uh, people go within themselves. And when you go within yourself, uh, in your case, and I think in the case of other people, you find that there are doorways that, you know, enable you to have out-of-body experiences and mystical experiences and and so forth, but uh, culturally speaking, I would say that uh, the problem began with the, the materialistic era in in which we're living began at, around the time of the Renaissance when uh, people began developing a, a, a humanistic perspective. Uh, you know, the idea that man is the measure of all things. Uh, started at, around the Renaissance, and at the same time, uh, the scientific revolution began, and uh, people like Francis Bacon and and, and others uh, developed science, and uh, the scientific uh, thinking was was very materialistic. It was a rejection of the dogmatic authority of the church, which had been. Uh, in Western culture, you know, dominant in the Middle Ages, uh, the great economic and artistic activities of, of the whole culture were organized around the church and religion and building cathedrals and the idea that this physical world is a, a veil of tears and that ultimately we'll spend our eternity uh, in heaven or hell after we die. Um, well, we outgrew that idea and and we switched over to a materialistic worldview which has enabled us to develop enormous scientific technology it's it's been wonderful in many ways but the human spirit is bigger than either a, a religious point of view or a scientific point of view it wants uh, a an ethos that can incorporate both of them and i think that's where we're heading now Yes, and, and the sad part of it is that though we have developed a lot of amazing technologies through the scientific materialistic approaches to science, you have to ask, how would the world be different today if science had not excluded the subjective realms and had developed qualitative measuring systems instead of just keeping it purely objective, uh, as I would say, left brain oriented? I've had many of these types in lectures I've given all over the world say, oh, you know, this talk that you're talking about, this is a bunch of bullshit. It's airy fairy stuff, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, inevitably it's somebody with a science background. And, and actually once I got into a very heated discussion with a scientist who came along with his wife to one of my advanced training courses and I allowed him to sit in for a while. I don't remember exactly what I was talking about, but I just looked at him and I said, I have a question for you. If I'm clear, what you're saying is if you can't weigh it or measure it, then it's not real. And he said, essentially, yes. I said, do you think that love is important in your life? And he said, absolutely. I said, how do you weigh it and measure it? How do you define it? What is it? And he just was speechless. I said, well, there you go. You see? Probably the most important thing in your life can't be weighed and measured, but here I am telling you about things that I use every day and teach thousands of people to use effectively as therapists every day, and you're denying them, yet at the same time, you're accepting the fact that you buy into the concept of love, which you cannot weigh and measure. So I use this as, as an example to say, we're playing a very dangerous game because one of the things that's happened with all the scientific materialistic advances in science is that we produced extremely dangerous technologies that are now destroying the planet at a very rapid rate, yet people are so in love with it and so in love with technology, they've lost touch with the earth and they've lost touch with the foundations and the roots of life and possibly the roots of consciousness when you're in an em embodied form. As we know, as the person's health breaks down, it alters their consciousness. So there's a direct relationship while you're in a body between the health of your body and the, and the capacity for consciousness. 
or at least to maintain, you know, a stable conscious base. Somebody who's, for example, got a very diseased liver or any organ has radical and obvious changes in their psychic functioning. So do you understand what I'm saying? I'm curious, what do you think would have happened and where would we be if we had allowed, uh, if we had developed a science that was uh, as invested in the subjective or unrational as it was in the rational objective? I, I understand what you're saying. And, you know, I've done a series of interviews with a very interesting lady named uh, Betty Kovacs. Uh, you might enjoy interviewing her if you haven't. Uh, she, she wrote a book called Merchants of Light. And as she points out that throughout history, periodically, there have been enlightened groups of people who have uh, endeavored to combine a, a scientific perspective with a shamanistic perspective. And, and these are moments of uh, cultural flowering, but almost inevitably uh, they have failed uh, to really gain traction. Uh, and the reason is because other groups of people are more interested in personal power and they find that they can manipulate and control people by um, basically, you know, developing a, a worldview and forcing a worldview, whether it's a scientific worldview or a religious worldview. It's based on the idea that don't trust yourself, trust the authorities. Yeah, wouldn't Tesla be one of those scientists in many ways that got shut down for that very reason? Uh, very possibly so. Uh, Tesla was was a great intuitive genius uh, responsible for modern technology, alternating current that powers uh, practically everything all over the world. Uh, we owe that to Tesla. Um, and he had many other inventions that uh, eventually got shut down. But in Tesla's case, he, he was operating in a very materialistic environment in the 19th, early 20th century. Uh, the, the great flowerings of, of uh, you know, a, a whole worldview and ethos where people could combine uh, science with a shamanistic perspective and, and uh, in which they understood uh, th how these two worlds work together and uh, where they rely on their own inner knowledge rather than def defer constantly to an external authority, whether religious or scientific. Those have been rare moments in human history. Now you can fully unleash the lean, energetic, youthful person locked up inside you or enhance the beauty, durability, and vitality you want to keep for the long run with Organifi's Red Juice. Would you like to satisfy your sweet tooth? Replace bad habits with good ones? Power through your tasks for the day with ease? You'll love the flavor, smooth texture, and rapid results of Organifi's Red Juice. Keep a packet in your purse or in your desk or in your pocket even your cell phone case. Grab a glass or a bottle of water and you're ready to go. This is natural energy provided by your body's own cells, not caffeine. Ignite the fire in your cells to enhance fat-burning metabolism. Turn back the clock on aging skin with real organic nutrition. It's never too late to change. Take these convenient go packs wherever you go. Though many are under the false impression that certified organic foods and drinks are much more expensive than commercially grown foods and drinks, that's a false impression. Organifi Red offers you anti-aging benefits, more energy, and aids in fat burning, and is cheaper per serving than a Starbucks latte, Gatorade Red Bull, or Palm Wonderful, and in my opinion, a lot better for you. Not to mention, buying certified organic products helps the farmers that are helping the planet in many beautiful ways. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, that's check 20, to get your 20% discount off any purchase. And all Living 4D listeners get to use this code for any product that Organifi sells. So enjoy, shop around, and get some healthy food and drinks for your family. My family and I use them every day, and I hope you love them as much as we do. 
I have a great book in my library, uh, and it, it basically, I can't remember the title. Of, it's by one of the authors of um, The Secret Life of Plants. So it's either Christopher Bird or Peter Tompkins. I think it's The Secret Life of Spirituality or something like that. I don't remember the title. It's been years since I read it. But he, hi- he features um, drawings made by, I believe, Annie Besant and another one by C.W. Ledbetter of atomic elements that had not been identified yet. And these are very, very good hand-done drawings that they did using their own clairvoyance. And they were, you know, scorned and denied. But unfortunately for the scorners, when scientists actually did identify those elements and they looked at them on electron microscopes or high-powered microscopes, they found that the structure that Basant and Ledbetter had identified was exactly the structure of those elements. Yeah, you're referring to uh, their description of deuterium, which was an isotope of hydrogen. There you go. So you remember it as well. Yes, it's a very important finding. Yes, and also Walter Russell identified two elements on the periodic table. And when he shared his research on it, two of the people that he shared it with ended up getting awarded Nobel uh, Peace Prizes for their research and never mentioned his name. And only later, I believe one of them apologized to him and uh, admitted his wrongdoing. But Walter Russell, you know, he had a 49 day period of union with the universe in which he became very enlightened. You must be familiar with his work. eh? Well, you know, I've heard a lot about Walter Russell, uh, and it's all been very positive, but I, I haven't had the opportunity to study his work as carefully as you obviously have. Well, I've studied it quite extensively. I did his one-year home study course. I think I've read all of his books, and they're absolutely mind-boggling. I think it was in 1926 or 27, he wrote a several hundred-page document, which I have in my library in hardcover, warning the U.S. government what would happen if they started playing around with nuclear power. and the exquisite, exquisite diagrams in that thing are mind-boggling and very incredible scientific language. But the key point here is Walter Russell only had a fourth grade education. He was a genius sculptor, a scientist, an amazing artist, uh, you know, and many, many amazing things. He invented the concept of the condominium and built the first condominium complex in New York City. Um, He was an architect. This is like one of, you know, almost like a Buckminster Fuller type genius, you know. And, uh, you know, the point is anyone that reads that document or studies Walter Walter Russell's work and denies parapsychological realities is, is just a fool. And there's, unfortunately, there's many people like that. I mean, I have a library with many books documenting these people. Well, I think to put it in broad terms, the way I would picture it and not having really gone into great depth on Walter Russell is that he would be part of what uh, some people call the new thought movement. Uh, the idea that uh, we, by changing the way we think we can change our life. Absolutely. Yes. He, he was a, a real pioneer of that concept. And a lot of his teachings are about, you know, managing your mind and learning how to use your mind effectively but also about the importance of integrating the heart and the mind. And he talks about love and and the importance of um, equanimity between giving and receiving and and a a number of other things. He was an amazing amazing human being, which is why I spent so much time reading his books. Uh, He's got a phenomenal book on light as well. Um, One of the things, too, that seems to have happened uh, with this industrial revolution and the, you know, the onset of scientific materialism is there's been a, a, a real dangerous downplaying of empirical science. And it's almost as though things that people learn through practical application, which, you know, if, if we think of ex- empirical science as the science of doing, you know, like I was doing empirical research on myself under heavy stress and lo and behold, proof beyond a shadow of a doubt in a contest that I actually had these skills and I've actually been able to use them to find lost people uh, where two serious cases, uh, three guys lost in the mountains that ultimately 
never got found by the Coast Guard uh, and the, uh, not the Coast Guard, the uh, National Guard. They're three students of mine. And then another time, uh, one of my students of mine in Australia, they had a huge fire and the uncle went missing and the house was burnt down. They couldn't find him. And I located him through remote viewing. And so, you know, to me, that's what I call empirical research. But we've now got this double blind kind of standard. And, and I tell people, you got to remember, double blind is double blind. When you're studying biological systems or human beings, you're studying cybernetic systems, which are systems of systems that are all fully integrated. And like a spider web, you can't touch any part of the spider web without the whole web moving. So when you start isolating systems and doing double blind studies, you're actually creating an illusion that you understand something. So you may know why, you may know, for example, that someone's cortisol levels are up too high, but you don't know anything about what caused it. So you're taking drugs to lower cortisol, but you're not looking at what's going on in their life. So you're not looking, for example, at the influence of their psychological environment and their health on their hormonal system. So don't you feel that we've lost something by putting empirical science in a, in a back seat like that? Oh, okay, you're using the term empirical science a little differently, I think, than I would use it. But um, l l let me say a, a couple of things about that. First of all, I agree with you uh, regarding the need for a holistic approach, that scientific experiments can only get us so far, that uh, it's very important to be able to use intuition. It's very important uh, to immerse yourself in, in the environment of people you're working with, doing field studies and case studies and so on. But with regard to parapsychology, one thing that double-blind controlled experiments will do is it will prove unequivocally that the phenomenon exists. And I, I think, as I mentioned to you earlier in uh, a recent article published two years ago in The American Psychologist, uh, there are some 1,300 parapsychological studies of an empirical nature that demonstrate uh, by any reasonable scientific standard that this is a legitimate phenomenon. And what you find with the uh, skeptics is they dismiss this kind of empirical science by saying, I don't care how good the evidence is, it's impossible. So something must be wrong. Yes, I've read a number of Dean Radin's books. And one of the things that he brings up is the fact that people won't look at the research if it goes against their belief system. And Ken Wilbur, who, whose work I've studied extensively, I have his entire collected works, and uh, his review studies of uh, the structure stages of consciousness shows that about 70% of the, I know the US population for sure, most likely the world population, are still at the level of uh, fundamental religion. And so, you know, what, what he shows is that it does not matter how much scientific evidence or hard evidence of any type you put in front of them, they will not acknowledge it and accept it. And so you got the, you know, in, in his stage, I think if I remember right, that's the traditional stage of conscious development. It starts with his, his system starts with magic, mystic, mythic, then traditional then modern, then postmodern, then integral uh, in that model. But when you, and he, and one of the reasons he was talking about this is because when Trump got voted in, it was, it's, it was, you know, quite a shock for people that think integrally. And so he was trying to explain how could that happen. And he was saying, you know, when, when politicians go after religious leaders and they get the religious leaders on their side, because most of them are at this, um, traditional stage of conscious development, it won't matter how much evidence you put in front of them to the contrary. Once they believe something, you can't get them out of that rut. So I, th I think part of the challenge is, is that, and, and this is something I'm, I'm asking you, I'm just sharing, but uh, don't you think that the fact that based on those statistics that such a large percent of the population is really at the level of development where they need a God in the sky. They need a daddy figure. They read books as though they're facts. As Joseph Campbell says, uh, if you're, if you're, if you read 
the Bible as a dictation as opposed to a connotation, you're in big trouble. And so when people are at that level of consciousness, it seems like if 70% of the population is that way, that means scientists are also made of the population and governments are made of the population and institutions are made of the population. And if 70% of us are still not mature enough in our conscious development to see and be willing to look at facts that may go against our belief system, then we really are, are sort of up against a, uh, you know, we're like in a, between a rock and a hard place. Well, as a parapsychologist, I do feel between a rock and a hard place. The, <laughs> uh, on the one hand, in academia, you have uh, a large portion of academia. I mean, look, I have a degree in parapsychology that's 40 years old, and it's the only doctoral diploma in parapsychology ever awarded in the United States. So you have, in academia, the general attitude is that this stuff doesn't exist, that it's all fantasy. And on the other side, amongst religious fundamentalists, they say, oh, it all exists, but it's the work of the devil. So, <laughs> so be yes, <laughs> like they do with tarot. <laughs> yeah. Between those two camps, uh, you know, there's a small percentage of the population, small but growing percentage of the population that says, you know, you know, it's, it does exist and it's not necessarily the work of the devil. Yeah. What, uh, just curious, could you, uh, maybe give me a, a more accurate definition because you were sort of suggesting that my use of empirical science was different. What, how, how, what, what would you define empirical science as, as to, to, uh, compared to say the more isolated reductionist view of science? Well, they go together very often. Uh, to me, uh, parapsychology is an empirical science. and I, I'm comfortable with that definition. Empirical means that, uh, to me, it means evidence that you gather of the external world through your five senses. Okay. I, I always thought, for whatever reason, after all these years, that empirical science was making scientific observations through uh, observation of something that you were doing that was more practical, like a farmer noticing that if you feed an animal a certain type of food, that it stops producing milk. I, I would call that a pragmatic approach. Uh, okay, that, that might be the distinction. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to, to get that because I wanted to make sure that if I was applying the concept incorrectly that I that I was aware of that because I don't want to mislead people. I think of uh, William James uh, is a person I have great admiration for who was one of the founders of uh, this pragmatic school of philosophy and uh, in in a nutshell what pragmatism is is if it works it's true might as well use it and uh, William James also wrote a fascinating book in which he, uh, which he called Radical Empiricism. And by that, it, it's very interesting. He sort of turned the empirical approach on its head. He said that the most direct information we have is our own consciousness. So let's consider our own consciousness as empirical evidence. Yes, yes. And I, I mentioned something uh, along those lines uh, in, in my series of questions I had for you, which I'll save it for later uh, because I want to be able to have a, a better discussion on that topic. But um, when we're talking about parapsychology and parapsychological experiences, you know, I can imagine there's listeners that don't really exactly know what we're talking about. So could you put on the table for us what is the bouquet? of experiences that fit the word parapsychological? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, there are two major categories. Uh, one is what typically is called extrasensory perception, the ability of the mind to receive information without the normal use of the senses. So that could include telepathy, mind-to-mind -mind communication, it can include 
precognition, seeing into the future, retrocognition, looking into the past, clairvoyance, just looking at distant locations, which really is the same as remote viewing. And then you have psychokinesis or mind over matter, which is sort of the more active form of psychic functioning. And that can include um, metal bending like Uri Geller uh, used to do. And and we've even had on our YouTube channel metal bending parties uh, online these days. People report forks and spoons and large metal bars can start to spontaneously soften so you can bend them without uh, applying any real muscular force or psychic healing could be an example of uh, psychokinesis. Or um, I wrote a book called The PK Man that that you mentioned earlier, uh, studying was a 10-year investigation of a fellow who could control large-scale phenomena like hurricanes, tornadoes. Yeah, I think you must have talked about that in one of your shows or somewhere I I heard uh, quite a comprehensive description. I may have even read it in something that you wrote. Yeah. I might have PK man, but I, I remember distinctly uh, hearing about that guy and he could he could uh, change the weather and do all sorts of wild and crazy stuff. And apparently he was a bit of a, a unusual character himself. That's that's all true. And I've done many uh, monologues and interviews about it on, on the New Thinking Aloud channel on YouTube. So those are the two main categories of parapsychological phenomena. Now, there's a third area, which is of interest, which has to do with survival of the human personality after death, postmortem survival, and that would also include the possibility of reincarnation. Um, And sometimes people say, we don't really need that as an extra category, because whatever evidence you find for postmortem survival could also be explained in terms of extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. So there, there's a sort of a, a debate within parapsychology as, as to whether we really uh, have evidence uh, for postmortem survival over and above the evidence that we have for extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. Yeah, that's an interesting tightrope to walk right there. I certainly have my own opinions on it, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I can see, I can see sort of the, uh, a double bind there. It's, it's a tricky, tricky thing to solve. It's kind of like trying to solve the riddle of what consciousness is. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. It's, you know, one of the challenges of solving what consciousness is, is you're using consciousness to try to solve what consciousness is. And I kind of an analogy I give my students is if you take two perfectly polished mirrors and face them at each other and ask them who they're looking at, what are they going to say to you? (laughs) Meaning, you know, both of them are symbols of consciousness looking at itself. So if you 
have two people in a, in a state of no mind or a non-dual awareness, neither of them is going to be aware that the other one's there, which is really the fundamental problem of describing God, because the only way you can describe God is to become one with God. And if you're one with God, then you're in a state of complete unity and there is no subject object relationship. Therefore, the only description you can give is an experience you had on the way into that state of unity and on the way out of it. But you can't describe what happened when you were there because there's no witness having an experience, i.e. no subject-object relationship. So it, it kind of creates an interesting scenario, but I, I think that my experience, which is many, um, and I've also had near-death experiences. I, I had a really bad motorcycle racing accident once, and I was in a coma for two days. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, I have kind of <laughs> had a chance to be without normal consciousness and, and be in, in that state. But I really don't think that anything that happened to me, I haven't experienced in shamanic ceremonies using plant medicines. And I've also had these experiences of complete non-duality in Tai Chi and, and meditation. Uh, so, you know, my, my position would be Whatever, when we're climbing up the ladder of structures of consciousness, we're climbing the ladder of consciousness itself. And if consciousness is the foundation of existence, as a lot of scientists say that are more open minded and more well put together, that what we call matter is really the condensation of consciousness. And if we listen to Einstein, that the field is the sole governing agency of the particle, it means nothing would have any atomic shape, form, or structure if there wasn't something in forming it, which would be the field itself, which, you know, some might refer to as mind. Um, so anyhow, th those are very interesting things. I did have a question for you. What about things like astral travel or inter or multi-dimensional travel where people, for example, describe going up to higher levels of dimensional realities, such as fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension. Um, you know, I do a lot of astral travel in my own spiritual practice, and I've studied many books on it. So where would that fit in into the categories of parapsychology? Well, it it's of great interest to me, but it's not necessarily something that parapsychologists study. It would be really more in the domain of transpersonal psychology, which is the study of spiritual experience, which, uh, of course, is also a, a big interest of mine. Uh, but if you're doing astral travel, for example, and and let's say you're you're going through what we might call the seven heavens uh, to achieve higher and higher states of spiritual illumination. I think that's very real. I think that it's uh, extremely profound for people. Uh, but a parapsychologist would probably only find that of interest if while you're in that state you can come back with let's say uh, something that can be verified in the uh, external world. Like maybe you'll come back with a design for a, a new invention or uh, a work of, a great work of art, or, or maybe uh, you happen to come across, um, you know, some information about where uh, uh, Kublai Khan buried a pot of gold so you can go dig it up. So, something along that. That's what we would call empirical verification. But if there's no possibility of empirical verification, then it's probably, um, it would fall within the domain of what William James called radical empiricism, because you're reporting the contents of consciousness itself. Uh, but that would really be more of interest to transpersonal psychology rather than parapsychology. I see. Well, I can tell you, I have many notebooks full of those experiences, and I have brought many things back. And I'm going to share one with you because I think you might find it interesting. I've studied alchemy for years and years. I've, I've studied Jung's collected works for 25 years at least. And 
you know, alchemy is uh, like astrology. The more books you read, the more you realize there's not a lot of consensus in, in many ways with, you know, things like directional influences, planetary influences, uh, and a variety of different things. Just like if you study uh, native healing techniques from around the world, you'll find different um, tribes or different groups of people or different cultures assigning different qualities to north, south, east, and west, for example. So I wanted to develop my own system of alchemy that I could use that would address human physiology, human psychology, and social psychology. In other words, how can we use the principles of alchemy for social problems like the situations we have going on in the world today? How can you use it for an individual with psychological challenges? And how can I use alchemy to help people understand their body? And so I spent years doing all this research and I've got a whole lot of books I've studied, a lot of notebooks on it. And I reached this point where I felt like I was kind of at loggerheads because there was so much conflicting information that I was coming across between people that were highly esteemed alchemists or writers on alchemy. So I said to my soul, I said, I really need help because I, I, can't get, I can't get clear within me how to build a system that's going to actually do what I want it to do. Because these, no matter which way I go, somebody who's trained in alchemy is going to look at it and say, this is wrong. And so I went into meditation and, and I, I meditated on this for a few days. I typically do a lot of my meditations in the sauna because I find it's easier to move into other dimensions and just easier opening for me. Or I do it during Tai Chi in the morning. But anyhow, a very interesting thing happened. I had built, I had been working on the psychological side of it and I had a system that I'd put together and I'd also been working on the physiological side of it. So I had these two different diagrams that I had been working with. And all of a sudden, Carl Jung and Rudolf Steiner showed up in this meditation, just like I was standing right there with them. And Carl Jung handed me a scroll. And he said, this is a gift for you. And I opened it. And in, in, in the middle of it was a diagram almost identical to mine, except he had put the names of each of the different alchemical, alchemical functions and the four functions of consciousness and key things that had to be included. And Steiner handed me a diagram that integrated all the pieces I'd been putting together on the physiological side of it. And they both smiled at me and said, put them together and your system is complete. I've used that system and taught it to thousands of my students as part of my HLC2 training. I've used it with great minds and great athletes and people that are highly intelligent. And anyone that practices and sees the system sees the obviousness of it, and it works extremely well. So there's an example of me being in an astral state, talking to people that are <laughs> supposedly dead, meaning supposedly dead, meaning yes, they're physically dead, but their spirit or their consciousness sure as hell isn't, or I wouldn't have got the information. Yet I was able to take these two diagrams, which they gave me, and I was able to read them and integrate them and create an incredible system, which someday I would love dearly to show to you. Well, I'd be very happy to see it. I think uh, it's fascinating because, uh, as I recall, um, while they were alive, Rudolf Steiner tried to reach out to Carl Jung, and Jung wanted to have nothing to do with him, even though they were both there in Switzerland, not far from each other. That's I, that, You're the first person to ever say that to me, and I've always wondered, how could those guys be so close to together in the same time frame and both be such geniuses and not actually communicate with each other effectively. And I actually have a book in my library comparing the philosophy and teachings of Steiner and Jung, um, which I've read sections of, but there's no mention of them ever getting together in it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, um, who is it? 
wondering if Carl Jung and Albert Hoffman spent some time together. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but I would say that uh, Jung, who was really quite a mystic, but he wanted to be seen as a scientist, and he was very much afraid that his reputation would be tarnished, I think, if he associated with uh, somebody the likes of Rudolf Steiner. Jung was very comfortable studying uh, historical mystics, but somebody who was a a living contemporary of his uh, became too threatening, I think. Yeah, and made it maybe it May, maybe it made him feel insecure, but you, how do you deny a guy who comes up with biodynamic farming, which is shown by scientific research to be consistently capable of producing the most nutritious feel, food of any farming system? He came up with anthroposophic medicine. He came up with a legitimate cure for cancer that's still used today, made from mistletoe. He developed the Waldorf school system. He developed Eurythmy, a system of movement for healing and correcting speech language path, speech pathologies. I mean, the list of Steiner's accomplishments that still endure today are are profound and can't be tracked back to somebody that gave them to him. He developed these things through uh, spiritual investigation, and I've studied him. I, I have 175 books of Steiner and Steiner initiates in my library. I've studied Steiner for years. But how do you, you know, there's no way you you start looking at people like that and if you deny parapsychology, then you're denying hard evidence right in front of you with somebody like that. Yes, yeah, Steiner is a, a great genius. I have enormous admiration for him. He was uh, trained uh, as a professional philosopher and actually uh, did some of his early work on the Nietzsche archives. He was hired by Nietzsche's sister to work on the archives, and he, he wrote a book about Nietzsche called uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, in English, the title would be Fighter for Freedom. Uh, many of the, his followers think of Steiner as the embodiment of the Nietzschean Superman because of uh, his, his many talents. You haven't even come up with the whole list. He developed a, a form of movement and poetry known as Eurythmy. He, yeah, I mentioned that. Oh, did you? He, he's also a great architect and a sculptor and designed a, a method of, of carving stained glass windows. Yes. And his first institute got burnt down by the very people that he helped fi- fix their agricultural problems. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as, as I recall, actually, it, it may have been Nazis who uh, felt very threatened by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, in- yeah. So he got smart and built the second building out of stone so they couldn't burn it down. <laughs> really a, a very, very remarkable uh, story, uh, well worth studying. Yeah. You know, and then of course, without going in a long segue, but you know, you start studying the Eastern literature and have you ever uh, read the books masters of the far East by Spalding? I have not. Oh, it's a series of six books from a United States investigation because I'm paraphrasing, because it's been many years since I read them. They were published in, I don't know, a long, long time ago, but they're still available. But it's six books in the series. And and the United States government sent a team, I believe it was to Tibet and one or two, maybe one or two other locations, but they kept getting reports of mystics that could do things like walk through walls and all sorts of stuff. And it was quite concerning to them. They wondered if maybe this was some kind of a security threat or something. So they sent a team, I believe, of either 11 or 13 scientists, and they went to study these people. And uh, first of all, they never gave these people any warning they were coming. And when their boat landed, there was a whole bunch of them standing there waiting for them, smiling, say, oh, we've been waiting for you. But they did all sorts of things, like they would mess with these scientists, and they would record every time they were speaking to any of these um, spiritual masters they were studying, they would write down in a log book exactly what time it was, where they were. And often at the end of the day, at dinner time, they would compare notes and find out that they were talking to the same multiple scientists were talking to the same person at the same time in completely different locations. So the these guys did all sorts of 
wild stuff that they documented in this uh, series called Masters of the Far East, which uh, concludes by 10 of them deciding not to come back and stay there and study with these masters because of what they'd uncovered. How interesting. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering if you can, um, you know, the question I have is, what are the types of belief systems that you find detrimental to our use of our conscious capacities? Let's just say our indwelling human capacities. For example, if I can remote view, chances are good most people can do it. If I can astral travel, chances are good most people can do it. If you can bend spoons, chances are good if I don't have a belief system in the way. I mean, I've looked at studies where they take children and teach them spoon bending and metal bending. And they find on average, children can do it very quickly and very easily, but adults have a very hard time. And the conclusion was the children don't have all these ideas about what they cannot do in their head. So I was just curious, do you have any way of encapsulating or any experience of just saying, well, what are some of the kinds of belief systems that get in the way of our use of our full range of conscious potentials, if we include that as the paranormal capacities? Well, one, one of the most consistent findings in parapsychology uh, that's been repeated over and over again is called the sheep-goat effect. Sheep are people who believe that they can do it, and goats are people who believe that they cannot. And they're both- <laughs> Yeah, Capricorn. <laughs> they're Resistant. both correct. <laughs> you know- um, I've got an excellent book. I mentioned it somewhere. It's, actually, it's right here in the next question. Um, so I'll jump forward to it. it. It's an excellent book. If you're not familiar with it, you might find it fascinating. It is on Audible. It's called How Emotions Are Made by a scientist named Lisa Feldman Barrett. And in there, she gives right up to date uh, science on how emotions are made, shows that pretty much all the models we've been using, including what they teach people like the uh, security services, FBI, CIA. I can't remember the guy's name that developed that model of, of facial reading and things like that, where it shows pictures of faces. And we assume that means the person's having that emotion. She showed that model is very, very dangerously wrong. Um, but one of the things she backs with hard science is, is this. Human beings see what they believe and they believe what they see. And that is just a fact. And in my studies of consciousness, there's a great book called Streams of Wisdom by Dustin DiPerna, and he makes a very potent point in there. He says, no Christian having a mystical experience ever sees Buddha, and nobody from any other religion sees the you know guru or spiritual icon of another religion in their own mystical experiences, showing that Consciousness is actually able only to communicate with you through your own, uh, basically your own programming. So if you don't know about Krishna or about Lao Tzu, you're never going to see them in any kind of a mystical state. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at these belief systems, uh, well, they can be helpful, but they can be extremely dangerous because belief systems by definition, are closed. Um, I, I read a book called The Religious Case Against Belief by James Carse, and he also wrote the book called Finite and Infinite Games, which is just a mind-blowingly good book. And I interviewed him, and uh, I think you'd find that interview with him fascinating. He's, a, uh, I don't know, he's probably about 80. Oh, he's almost 90 now, but he's still very, very sharp and really on it. And him and I were talking about belief systems as well, and he, and he makes it very clear in the book that by definition, a belief system is closed. And if a belief system's not closed, it's almost impossible to identify what the belief is. And he basically shows this is why belief systems reject outside material and why they're so sustainable, because people are basically programmed not to accept other information. So, you know, what do you... You know, you mentioned earlier, we, we were talking about my experiences of trauma and, and how that led to uh, developing, you know, special abilities or parapsychological abilities. And we know that that's also very common, as you mentioned. Um, what do you feel it takes to open one up so that they 
you know, if, if belief systems are the limiting factor and we're just swimming in these things, have you meditated on how do we help people open up so that they aren't being choked to death by something that may have served them at one point in their life, but now isn't, or do we just have to wait for them to be in enough pain to be split open? Wow, that's a fascinating exposition, Paul. Uh, first of all, let me say, I think you must have a fabulous library. I do. I would love to show it to you someday. <laughs> I've spent 36 years collecting the best books I could find from all over the world. And I had a, a, a intuition that you and I have stood in one of the same bookstores. Have you ever been in Fields Bookstore in San Francisco? Oh, yes. Of course. I, when you were talking about San Francisco, I had an image of you in Fields Bookstore. I said, oh, him and I go to that same bookstore. Which if if I recall, it was on Polk Street. Yes, it was. They closed it because they were losing so much money to, to the internet. So they oh. shut it down. I think they just do uh, uh, website orders and mail orders now. But I bought a lot of books out of Fields. That was a great bookstore. Same with Watkins in London. Have you been to that one? Uh, no, I haven't been to Watkins. Uh, Powell's in Portland is a, a wonderful bookstore as well. Uh, oh, that's good to know. Hi, everybody. My friends at Bioptimizers have formulated the most complete, potent, and first full-spectrum magnesium formula ever created. It's called Magnesium Breakthrough. If there's one mineral you should be worried about not getting enough, it's magnesium. Magnesium is the body's master mineral, providing over 300 critical reactions, including detoxification, fat metabolism, energy production, and even digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. But there are two big problems here. Magnesium has been largely missing from U.S. soils since the 1950s and probably soils around the world wherever commercial farming is done, which explains why it's estimated that up to 80% of the population may be deficient in magnesium. Most magnesium supplements only contain one or two forms of magnesium, when in reality there are at least seven your body needs and benefits from. If you take this later fact into consideration, it's logical to conclude that 99% of the population is likely to be deficient in two or more essential forms of magnesium. The good news is that when you do get all seven forms of magnesium, pretty much every function in your body is upgraded from your brain to your sleep to reducing pain and inflammation, and it all improves fast. The Bioptimizer's formulation team even included trace amounts of something called monoatomic magnesium, which helps make all the other forms of magnesium more bioavailable. With magnesium breakthrough as part of your daily supplement routine, you are likely to reduce your stress levels and feel relaxed and at peace, boost your immune system, maintain optimal heart rhythm, sleep faster and deeper. Better sleep quality is a surefire way to reduce your stress and to enhance overall performance. Sleeping better and having all seven forms of bioavailable magnesium to support your body is a great way to lower cortisol levels, which not only enhances cortisol melatonin balance, but people with adrenal exhaustion, often experiences chronically low energy levels, are likely to experience better short-term memory and improved cognitive performance as a result of enhancing their magnesium profile. And to my knowledge, Magnesium Breakthrough is the most complete magnesium supplement blend available. To get your magnesium breakthrough, go to bioptimizers.com forward slash living 4D. That's bioptimizers, B I O P T I M I Z E R S dot com forward slash living number four small d. And your checkout code for your 10% discount is all small case P A U L 10 for your 10% off any order. Enjoy magnesium breakthrough, sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. Anyway, back, back to the point you raised, I have to agree with you that one of the strongest findings in the field of social psychology is, is exactly what you said, that, that people uh, seek information that reinforces their existing beliefs, and they ignore information that contradicts their existing belief systems. And in general, it's certainly true. People who have near-death experiences, if they see uh, beings of light and uh, spiritual figures, they interpret it typically within their own particular uh, framework. Uh, so the cultural frameworks are very powerful, but they're not, in my experience, absolute. 
uh, let me give you a uh, an exception. I had a very powerful experience early on in my life that helped shape my career in which a great uncle of mine uh, appeared. And I have a Jewish background, and this my great uncle Harry was a very orthodox Jew. Uh, but in my, uh, and this was a dream experience, he began talking to me in a very deep way about my life, using the symbolism, to my surprise, of the Chinese yin-yang. Wow. And when I awoke from that dream, I was in tears, I was crying, and I was singing simultaneously uh, a Jewish song that sung at uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the high holy holidays in in Judaism. And I've never had that happen to me in my life, uh, where I have awoken uh, from a dream, singing and crying at the same time, or even one or the other. But it happened. So I wrote home. I said, how's Uncle Harry? I had a dream about him. And my mother called me instantly when she got my letter and said, how did you know Uncle Harry just died? Wow. And it made me appreciate that very likely because of reincarnation, we, we have had past lives in many different cultures that... Uh, When you get to the level of the soul, we're not always limited to simply the culture in which we were raised. How do you feel what we're talking about plays out with this whole COVID pandemic? I've done probably 150 hours of research into what's really going on and watched numerous videos and documentaries. I've watched the recent pandemic documentary, which I thought was awesome. And there are so many well put together, highly intelligent doctors telling a story that goes radically against what the party line is and what's being told to people on televisions. And, you know, it's my point in bringing that up is because, you know, where I live here out in Fallbrook, there's the people are pretty open and hip to the game. And there's hardly anybody out here that got sucked into it and wears masks and all that stuff. People were giggling and inviting people over to come have a drink at their house. Don't worry about the mask where we don't play those games. But then there's people, you know, you, I, I was at the beach uh, this weekend because my son was here with his kids and his partner. And, and so we went to the beach and, 99.9% of the people on the beach are not wearing masks, but every now and then you see someone wearing them. But, you know, it's just like, I look at this and I do the research and it very clear to me that we have two camps here. One that believes whatever they're told through the media and the others that ask critical questions and look into things for themselves. I'm just curious, what is your take on belief systems and how that relates to the pandemic, considering the power of television. I tell my students, remember the word television means tell a vision. Well, I I haven't studied the uh, situation uh, the way you have, Paul, but I I suspect that uh, uh, we have a different attitude about the media in in general. I uh, have one of my first cousins, uh, Stephen Roberts uh, spent his career in the media, and he teaches journalism at uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He covered the White House for the New York Times. And my impression is that uh, people who are journalists are very conscientious. They're working very hard to get the story correct. Uh, they don't always do it. Uh, by and large, I don't believe that they are under the thumb of the people who uh, own the media uh, uh, outlets and uh, who control them. I think the reporters are given largely, not entirely, a a, a free reign. So I tend to trust uh, what I read in in the media. Uh, I do think you have to look at it critically, for sure. Uh, but, you know, there's a, a, a faction in our country that says the media is the enemy of the people. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the media 
is trying to hold those people accountable and uh, they react against it. But uh, so if I had to choose between uh, what the mainstream media is telling us and what the alternative media is, is telling us, I, I would go with mainstream media because uh, as far as I can tell, mainstream media tries very hard conscientiously to be accurate and uh, the alternative media feels if they're 85 percent accurate, they're doing a good job, which means 15 percent of uh, what they publish is not reliable. That's very interesting. Uh, that's sort of uh, you, you surprised me. I never really thought I would have heard that from you. But, you know, I can honor and worship that. That's that's you, know, your... you don't have to worship it. Well, you know, I, I could I can I, I, I can respect it as your experience and your opinion. That, and, and, that is you know. my experience and opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So because I respect you as a person, I, I and I try to respect everybody, I have to make room for as many viewpoints as possible, or I limit my own capacity to gather. Well, you know what? We're we're in 100% agreement there. I think it's very important to respect everybody, no matter uh, what their background or uh, even their behavior. When I worked in San Quentin prison with rapists and murderers, I felt they deserved as much respect as anybody else. Yeah. You know, um, if you haven't watched the documentary called Plandemic, it's very, very revealing. And I think it might be, and, and, there, and they give plenty of resources you can check out for yourself quite easily doing a web search that uh, backs it all up. Mm-hmm. And w- one of the things they've shown, and I've heard it from other experts investigating this, and I interviewed a lady named Leslie Manukian, and she actually tracked uh, where all Bill Gates's money is going in this regard, but they show very clearly, and they actually show news reports from all over the world simultaneously giving exactly the same message, but those messages were tracked right back to a think tank owned and funded and controlled by Bill Gates. And so when you see some of these investigative documentaries uh, that are traceable. They give you plenty of evidence to look into it. It, it definitely uh, gives you a chance to ponder these things, but that's okay. I just was curious because, uh, you know, I just love your opinion on things and um, we can leave it at that. I don't want to uh, lose an opportunity to talk about lots of other cool things. Well, let me let me say something since you brought up uh, Bill Gates in, in this context. And I uh, I I do hear from viewers uh, on New Thinking Aloud. I get hundreds of emails a day from viewers, uh, and and the, so they talk about pandemic and they talk about Bill Gates as if he were an evil person who is trying to uh, destroy and control and etc. Et and I get very nervous when people point to somebody else who they think is an elite who was trying to control their life and who they think is evil because it strikes me that uh, the worst crimes in the history of humanity have been committed by people who believed that they were fighting evil. And and there's an enormous... (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) There's an enormous tendency for people to take their own uh, dark side, their own shadow side in, in Jungian terms, and to project it out on, onto somebody else. So I, I'm very concerned that people are doing this to Bill Gates. And so when I hear from people who tell me they know that there's somebody out there who is the evil one that they have to fight against, uh, I usually say to them, uh, I have three words t- for you. Look inside yourself. Yes. Well, you know, in, in the Tao Te Ching, um, Lao Tzu says the government is made of the people and lets us know that if there's problems in the government is because there's problems in the people. And it's every institution, every organization is made of, of people from the collective. So no matter what's going on in the world, you know, in other words, you, you, if you point a finger at Bill Gates or Donald Trump or whoever or the government, you're really pointing at yourself anyhow, because we all 
are part of the collective from which the people in any of these organizations, be it the medical system, the police system, the prison system, the banking system, is drawn from. And this is why most of the greatest spiritual teachers that ever walked the planet said, change yourself and you'll change the world. Well, I, I agree with that. And I also agree with uh, something you said earlier about embracing the whole universe, that you, you find yourself in a certain state of consciousness where you know you're one with everything. Yes. And, you know, this brings up uh, something I'd like to share with you. You know, one of my favorite definitions of consciousness is by uh, a famous Jungian analyst named Edward Edinger. Are you familiar with him? I am. Yeah. So Edinger said, I'll put it in paraphrase, consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. And when we, when we look at the issues of the world, um, have you ever heard of the series of book series uh, called The Law of One by Ra? Yes, I have. So in Ra, Ra's books, they talk about how there are people that come into the world specifically to uphold the negative polarity. We refer to those people typically as evil, but they describe how consciousness cannot function without these, without a, a duality, without, uh, you know, just like an electric motor has to have a positive and a negative polarity or a magnet has to have a north and a south pole. So in, when you look at the history of the world, there's no record showing that it was ever some kind of utopia where everything was all smooth and hunky dory and people weren't fighting and killing and doing all the things that we've been doing forever. And when I look at this from a perspective of consciousness, it seems to me that the world is really a schoolyard where souls come to learn how to work with the polarities of consciousness so that when we leave our body or when we get into other dimensions because having done a lot of work in the astral realms and other realms, you you're, you'll find that the reality that you're in changes as fast as your thinking does. And so one of the things I've heard uh, some of the teachers and masters that I've studied say, and Steiner talks about this too, is that we spiritual practices are to develop the subtle body organs, each of which matches our physical organs. So clairvoyance would be the vision you use when you are out of your physical body, Claire, audience would be hearing outside of your physical senses. And so spiritual practices give us the necessary development of the subtle energy organs or light body organs that allow us to remain conscious when we die so that we can consciously make choices about what we want to do next. So the point I'm driving at is that if we, if we agree that consciousness requires this duality or polarity, you can't know what North is without South. You can't know male without female. You can't know good without evil. Then it seems to me that one of the functions or reasons the world is always going through these polarized sort of experiences is because they're necessary for cultivating consciousness. And when we create challenges and pain for each other, it inspires creativity. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts on that are. Yes, I, I would in general agree with what you have said. Although um, here, here's an exception, though. I don't think that the world has always experienced war and conflict. Uh, as best I can tell, uh, if we go back far enough in history, there was a time when the, the worship of the goddess was more predominant. And uh, in those cultures, uh, they lived more peaceably. Uh, in, in cultures where men and women were treated as equal, uh, it's typically the um, patriarchal cultures that worship a sky god uh, that tend to be more warlike. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to let you know about Symbiotica's Synergy Vitamin C with Silica. It's an amazing product. There's all sorts of unique applications. In fact, it helps with so many things we'd never be able to tell you about them all. So I've asked Sherveen to tell us, because he formulated it, what are the three most 
likely things we're going to need this product for. So Shervine, how do we use Synergy Vitamin C with silica? This is our first product that we did that's actually not in a 60 ml or 100 ml bottle. It's actually in a 16 ounce bottle. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you got a lot of servings in there. And, you know, I was really excited about this because I've always been a fan of vitamin C. It's antioxidant abilities. Um, you know, everybody knows what vitamin C is, but immune support, immune support, things like that. But we took fermented vitamin C on this one. So it goes through a fermentation process and the energy source is cassava. Everybody knows what cassava is. They're, they're selling cassava chips everywhere. Yeah. So we went through that fermentation process to create this vitamin C and we combined it with bamboo silica. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and a lot of research behind silica. You're a Steiner guy. I'm a Steiner guy. Silica no, is the levitation mineral. Yeah. It's what pulls us closer to the sky, gives us wings essentially. And it makes sense. If you understand the pharmacology of silica, it bonds to our joints. It bonds to our skin. And this whole thing right now with collagen production, yes. collagen products on the market, using meat products, byproducts of meats and stuff, why not use your own endogenous ability to right. create collagen within, not just for your face, but for your organs, for your lymphatic system. Connective tissue. Connective tissue. Joints. Correct. So I have all the top athletes on the world on this right now, and they're getting the best reviews I'm an athlete myself. I'm training every day. I'm feeling so strong with this product. My immune system's strong. My eyes are white. My skin is clear. This thing is a powerhouse. I'm really, really stoked on it. Well, there you go. Go to Symbiotica, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com to get your Synergy Vitamin C with Silica. On checkout, use the code CHECK15, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15, to get your 15% discount. And while you're there, check out all the other amazing products because your discount is across the board. Enjoy. Let me add this to this. Oh, here's it's, got some more. It's the best flavor ever. It tastes like orange, vanilla, delicacy, guava. It, it's, it's incredible. Your favorite sorbet out there. Now you get it in the most healthiest form ever. Great natural medicine with no great sugar, taste. No sugar, no sugar, nothing. Beat it. Symbiotica.com, C Y M B I O T I K A on checkout. Capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K 15. Dig it, love it. Can't wait to hear your feedback. I, I think from studies of anthropology uh, that I've looked at over the years, there's pretty much. Uh, quite a long trail of evidence of tribal warfare going as back uh, as as far as anthropological records can go. So I, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying this is something I can't be objective about, but I can only say that. And, you know, you also have to realize that uh, when we're talking about a, a polarity necessary for consciousness, the magnitude of the polarity could be very different in a society like you're talking about. Uh, it's It's going to be for sure that nobody's going to agree on everything always. And there's no way that you can have a concept of good without a concept of bad or right without wrong. So no matter what your uh, what society you're dealing with, it's just going to be a level of magnitude of those polarities. So I, I think yeah. the society you're describing would be less polarized. Would that sound right to you? Y yes, it would. Of course, tribal warfare uh, has always occurred. It's just been, you know, somebody will throw a spear and uh, hit somebody else, and, and then they'll go and throw a spear back at them. It's not like massive... Uh, uh, genocidal wars like like we have had in more recent history. Well, fortunately, they didn't have the technology we do. Or we don't know what they might have tried to do with it. <laughs> well, it, it does seem as if they had some amazing technologies that have been lost uh, when you look at things like the construction of the pyramids in Egypt, for example. Yes. I, and the question is, are those the technologies of primitive peoples on this planet or are they things that were brought here from people coming from uh, other regions of, of the universe or solar system or galaxy, whatever way you want to slice that? It's, it's pretty, you know, as you know, there's an infinite amount of discussion debate. Well, you mentioned the raw transmissions. So that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that I know they claim that uh, uh, there's been an extraterrestrial component uh, going back as, as far as human history goes. Well, they actually, Raw says that they were the ones, that entity, Raw, is the ones that built the pyramids. And they said, what you don't understand about the pyramids is that they're not actually things that were built by hand. They are thought forms and that they 
intentionalize those pyramids. And that's why they're built with such perfect precision. And they actually say in the law of one that they left impurities in certain places so that people would actually believe that they were built by hand because they would not be able to conceptualize how a thought form can be constructed. Yeah, I've just started to get into some of that literature, uh, uh, the law of one and, and Ra, and I, I find, you know, I'm very yeah, much in tune to the idea of the law of one. I, I haven't really studied all the other fine points of it, but it, it's quite intriguing to me. It's extremely good. Uh, you know, I've, I don't devote myself to studying a lot of material unless my soul says, this is what you're supposed to be learning right now. And so um, I put a lot of time into it. And, uh, you know, the, one of the things that's interesting is was one of the channelers was a physicist. So that, that certainly caught my ear right off the bat, because here's a highly trained scientist who's working in what you would call the paranormal and working with a team of people to gather information and somebody who has the depth of knowledge to ask highly intelligent questions. And he really does ask some very good scientific questions in there. And I must say they give some damn good answers. So if to understand that correctly, he was working with the channeler, I gather. He was the questioner. He wasn't the one who went into trance. I believe it was a woman who actually- Yes, it was a woman. They actually did try uh, at different times. Not She was the one that they basically realized defaulted to. But from what I remember, he would try it and the third person would try it. But she seemed to be the one that was the ultimately the, the one most gifted. And, and so- Ultimately, that's who they did the research with. Mm -hmm. But they even had uh, meetings where they tried to find, you know, who who could do what with various people from their tight knit group. But uh, but uh, to have Don Elkins there uh, to evaluate the material as a skilled and trained scientist, I thought really added a lot of credibility to it. Well, I'm very interested in uh, some of the channelings that have come through, uh, like the Ra material, like the Seth material, and like A Course in Miracles, where you have a, a very coherent uh, body of information that seems to be coming through, uh, that's well-organized and uh, seems to be pointing toward higher consciousness. And it seems to me that it it's not likely that this is simply the product of the subconscious mind of, of the channeler. It seems too specific. And in the case of the raw transmissions, the, the language, the linguistics of it is so very unique. Yeah, it is. And, and like you mentioned, I've, I've studied a, a Seth, a fair bit of the Seth stuff. I've read an entire book. And the way I do these things is I just ask my own soul, which I've been working with my own soul for, you know, probably 25 years. And, and because I'm clairvoyant and have other voyances as well, my soul will show me images or talk to me. And I've, I've always asked my soul, is this worth studying? Is this true? My, my whole, basically, once I came to the point where, and, and you might find it interesting, I, I was, I found that. Uh, just like with alchemy, I was studying the soul. And I probably got about 130 or 40 books on the soul, and I found all sorts of conflicts and, you know, just there was so much. I couldn't put a complete consensus together on what the soul was. It's just too many varying opinions and opposed opinions. So one day I was sitting in the sauna, and I thought, if I have a soul, well, only God could give a soul or whatever it is that creates the universe. And my model of the soul was based on my own belief that the soul really is consciousness within. In other words, the consciousness within Jeffrey Mishlov is what is his soul. And the consciousness within Paul Check is what is his soul. But the fact that we're all part of one means that we're like shall we say, eddies in an ocean of consciousness within which we are having our own experiences, which are automatically reported to the whole in a feedback loop, which goes right in line with Fred Hoyle's research 
in quantum physics and how he believes that the universe is self-observing and isn't a perpetual self-feedback mechanism. So I'm in the sauna and I just said, okay, well, shit, if my soul is real, then let me ask it a question and see what happens. And I, you know, I went to training with monks when I was a, a 15 year old. My mother raised us in the self-realization fellowship with Yogananda's teachings. So I was learning meditation and practicing meditation techniques from the time I was 12 and spent the summer with monks when I was 15. So I, I know how to calm my mind and I know how I know distinctly when my own mind or ego is manufacturing thoughts and when I've completely shut it off. So I just said, I sat in the sauna and I closed my eyes and I did what shaman call emptying the bone, which means get rid of any internal dialogue or anything and make yourself a complete ear, a complete vessel of receptivity. And I said, dear soul, if you are real and you are listening, do something to sh show me that you're there and do something that I couldn't possibly do myself. And all of a sudden, I had a huge uprising of energy like an artesian well and energy just flowed right up my spine and shot right out the top of my head. And I went, wow, what in the world was that? I don't even know how to do that to myself. So I said, dear soul, if that was you, do that three times in a row so I'm sure it's you. Sure enough, surge, surge, surge. And I'm like, my God, there you are. So I said, okay, show me what it feels like when you say yes to me if I ask you a question. Boom, I got that big uprising of energy. Show me what it feels like when you say no. And my energy sunk down and I had the same feeling as when you know somebody's telling you a lie. And I said, okay, so that's what it feels like when you're saying no. And she said, yes. So probably now for, I don't know, 20, 25 years, I've been working and working and working and letting my soul do everything, choosing which airline flights I'm going to take, uh, which books I'm going to read, how to find books. I'll give you a quick example. I was doing a year of Egyptian sun gazing as a practice because I, my soul led, led me to that. And I also became a vegetarian for that year and had many profound experiences through these practices I was led to. And while I was Egyptian sun gazing, the spirit of the sun appeared to me. And I was first quite shocked because it looked like pictures of Jesus Christ, but he had brown skin. And I said, who are you? And he said, I am the spirit of the sun or the consciousness of the sun, the logos of the sun. And I said, really, that's amazing. I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Umbakara. I said, wow, how do you spell that? U-M-B-A-K-A-R-A. -A -A. I said, is there anybody that's written any of the books in my library that would mention that name so I can verify that and know that I'm not just hallucinating right now? He said, yes, there is. I said, thank you. So as soon as I finished the dialogue I was having with him, I walked right into my library and said to my soul, is there a book in our library that would describe who Umbakara is or give a meaning of that name? My soul said, yes. I said, take me to where that book is. My soul walked me right over to the bookshelf and I let my soul take my eyes over. And she took my eyes right down to the second bookshelf from the bottom and then stopped right on a uh, one of my big theosophy books, which has a, a large glossary in it. And she said, if I remember right, page 534. I opened it to page 534 and in bold print in the glossary, was Umbakara, the spirit of the sun. And there was a small paragraph describing the uh, cultures and historical interactions with Umbakara, the spirit of the sun. What a wonderful story. Well, that's, that's as true as I'm talking to you right now. And that's how I guide and, and teach my students. I teach them how to make access with their own soul <clears throat> so that they can be led by the you know, the, the higher consciousness within themselves, the higher self. But, uh, you know, that leads to my next question because, um, you know, I'm sharing this with you because I know you're a man that can understand that I'm not a nutcase by telling you these things. And I've got way too much objective evidence. For, uh, you know, I have an institute that takes seven years 
to complete the training. It's multidisciplinary with doctors and therapists from all over the world, and many of them in very, very high places like the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and if, my, if, my, if I was a nutcase, I wouldn't be attracting people like that, and I wouldn't have been in business as an institute since 1995. But what I wanted to know too is what are some of your things that you have? You talked about your dreaming, but you know, are there other ways that you experience the parapsychological or the or the subtle realms or things that would be more in line with what I'm sharing here that have helped you stay connected to that reality as a reality? Uh, <clears throat> well. I think uh, my experience is probably very different than yours. Uh, I I tend to have fewer visionary experiences of, of the type that you've just described. I think it's wonderful, Paul, that you refer to your soul as she. Uh, I like that a lot. You know why? Yeah, no, tell me why. Well, after a, a year or two of talking to my soul through this energetic dialogue, which is kind of like dousing where you have to post questions with a yes or no answer. I've been clairvoyant since I was young. And I finally realized, why don't I just ask my soul to appear to me so I can actually see my soul? And so my soul appeared to me as a woman. And I said, oh, that's amazing that you're a woman. Why are you a woman? And my soul said to me, because you're a man. And the truth of you is unity. And because your body is a male and you're living the life of a male, I have to compliment you in this lifetime as a woman. And if you were to be a woman, then I would be your masculine potential. And when you marry the feminine of you with the masculine, you become whole, and I am here to guide you to your wholeness, and you will be best led into your feminine potential by a woman. That's, of course, quite consistent with Jungian psychology. It is. Yes, it is. And and I was very excited to find when Jung described that why a man has an anima and a woman has an animus because it fit exactly what my soul said. And it actually made me have, you know, almost like, uh, what do you call it when your hair stands up? You know, it's like, oh, wow, I'm being led again. Well, you uh, obviously have a, a wealth of uh, uh, knowledge from your studies and uh, inner experiences. Uh, also, I, I think for me, it's much uh, probably simpler. I, you know, I do have these guides that come to me in dreams and synchronicities, but, but basically I followed uh, uh, a dictum for myself, which is just be present, be here now, moment by moment. And uh, uh, when I do monologues, for example, on the you know, New Thinking Aloud channel, I call them in presence. And uh, for some time, I was president of an organization uh, called the Intuition Network, where we dealt with, uh, it was a, a mutual support network for highly intuitive people, people working professionally in the field of intuition. And uh, we called that group in presence as, as as well, meaning, you know, just be here now, be with what is happening right in front of you at this moment. Uh, it served me very well. That's amazing. And, and, you know, I think that's the beauty of each of us. We all come with unique abilities, skills. Many people, my many of my students come to me and say, Paul, how do I become clairvoyant or how do I develop my voyances? And I, I say to them, all of us have one unique something. You might be clairvoyant. You might be clairsentient. You might be clairaudient. You could have just intuitive knowing and not know how it happens, but find that you have this ability to just know things. So what I tell people is work with the one you've got. And when you've got it to the point where you're really comfortable with it, then ask your inner self or your soul to help you develop the next 
level of development, because by the time you've done that, you will have confidence that these abilities are actually real and there will be no fear or internal resistance to unlocking your potentials. And I found that my students that follow that advice actually uh, continue to develop their voyances. And, and some of them have been able to develop all of the voyances that we you know, typically think of. And that's what happened with me is, is one just led to the other because the more I saw how my life was so much better when I let my soul guide me and when I trusted my my intuitive insights, my inner vision, and my voyances, be clairsentience or whatever, that my life was just better and better. And I was always just like, thank God I didn't listen to my ego on that one or I'd be broke right now. And um, I think that once we sort of get that confidence, then it allows us to kind of open our belief system enough to let the kind of the truth of us start to pour out. Well, I, I really appreciate the idea of the balance between the masculine and the feminine. I think that's really essential. Yes, I, you know, and the alchemists teach, you know, extensively on, you know, you can't come into union um, until you have balanced the masculine and feminine potentials within yourself. I'm a painter and an art therapist as well, and I went into meditation and my soul gave me a beautiful diagram to paint that symbolizes the union of the male and the female. So I use it in my morning prayers and it's sitting right on the wall. So I have this reminder every day. It looks kind of like a, like the Sri mantra, a Sri Yantra diagram, but it's circular instead of uh, triangular. But the alchemists talked extensively about the need to um, marry the male and the female and bring them into balance. Jung talked a lot about that and, and so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, if anyone really thinks about what does it mean to be a man and can you really reach your potential as a man without the understanding and the connection to the feminine qualities, then the answer is no. You can be a great warrior, but you might be very dangerous to your own family and your own people. And I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division myself, so I know what it means to be a warrior. I fought on the army boxing team. I was a kickboxer for years. So I've traveled the path of the warrior. And I can tell you right now that when you get a bunch of warriors together in a place like the 82nd Airborne Division, if they don't have that connection to the feminine, they come home and there's a lot of violence in families. There's a lot of heartbreak and broken families because warriors don't know how to access their feminine. So they come home and they're just uh, you know like bullets bouncing off the wall. And so I, having lived that and been raised by a very violent stepfather, it, I got an early internship in my life as to what happens when masculine energy is not effectively counterbalanced by feminine energy. And when you study, you know, as many of the great mystics and, and gurus as I have, you find people like Yogananda, Babaji, Jesus, many of them, you can't tell whether they're male or female. You can almost go either way because they've so unified their psychic potentials that their body reflects that. I couldn't agree with you more. You've put it very eloquently, Paul. Well, coming from you, that's quite a compliment. What are, what are some of the most incredible parapsychological events that you've witnessed or that you've seen objectified by researchers in the field? Uh, I would say that, uh, the material that I report on in the book, The PK Man, sort of uh, uh, was way over the top. Uh, I was still a graduate student when I first ran into Ted Owens in 1976, as I recall. Um, he, and it all started when I visited SRI International. Uh, where my friends Hal Putoff and Russell Tard were pioneering the, the whole uh, research uh, on remote viewing, working with Ingo Swan, and I uh, participated in my first remote viewing exercise back then, which uh, was quite successful. And, awesome. And then at, while I was there, they showed me they had this big file from this character named Ted Owens, and 
uh, he was writing to them because they had gotten uh, a lot of publicity for the research they had done with Uri Geller. And he wrote to them and he said, why are you wasting your time with Uri Geller? I'm the world's greatest psychic. You should be studying me. And he said, just to prove to you I'm the world's greatest psychic, I'm going to end the drought that's going on right now in California. This was February 1976 uh, when he sent this letter to them. And, and it was a very serious drought at the time. Uh, and uh, he said, you'll know that I'm ending the drought because it'll happen in just a few days. There will be rain and sleet and hail and snow, every kind of strange weather. He said there will be power blackouts and there will be UFO sightings, which is one of his signatures. And he said, your local newspaper will run a story in three days saying that this drought is over. Well, all of that happened. Wow. And so uh, Russell Targ sent him a note saying that was a wonderful prediction. And he sent them back, as I recall, a telegram basically saying, hell no, it was not a prediction. I caused it. <laughs> yes. Through, through psychokinesis. And at that point, uh, I, I, right after that occurred, I was visiting them and, and they were so eager to get that file out of their office because at the time they were getting funding from the CIA and uh, they didn't want to have such a controversial, colorful figure uh, around that it was, you know, you, you, if you're working with you know, government intelligence agencies, you want to have a low profile. And Ted Owens was too flamboyant and uh, too much, I suppose, of a publicity seeker. So they saw me as a promising young graduate student. And they said, would you mind taking over this uh, case and doing the research on this guy? So uh, I was pretty uh, naive and sort of uh, eager at the time. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And, um, and a little notice got published in uh, Psychic Magazine, which was a publication in those years, uh, a little news item that this had happened. They reported it to the uh, Jim Bolin, who was the editor. And he said, yes, this guy predicted he would end the drought. And it did end. And at the same uh, time around then, there was a drought going on in England, and they were also about to have a big parapsychology conference, which I planned to attend. And uh, the organizers of the conference thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could get this guy who's so good at ending droughts to end our drought? So Ted Owens was invited to come to England to end the drought there. And um, the, when I arrived in London, the drought was so severe that they, they had to bring water in by trucks to some of the towns on the outskirts of London. And I was staying with uh, some friends there, and they told me, if you want to get your picture on the front page of the London Times, all you have to do is walk down to Piccadilly Circus carrying an umbrella. People will think you're crazy, and they, <laughs> they will take your picture and put it on the front page of the newspaper, and, because there was no end in sight to the drought. But the day Ted Owens arrived in London, it began rain and hail and sleet and power blackouts, and uh, it, the rain was so heavy they had to shut down the what they call the tube, the, sub, the subway. And it seemed as if, uh, well, the local newspaper ran the story the next day, the drought is over. That's amazing. Yeah. So that happened in London. And I met him at the conference, only he's this big, boisterous American type. And, and British people, uh, you probably know, they're rather reserved and they don't like big, noisy Americans. By and large, they're very polite and and they don't like to brag. They're very modest. And here's Ted Owens, who said, "I'm the great PK man," <clears throat> and he was to speak at this conference. 
and and they literally halfway through his talk pulled him off the stage. Uh, you're kidding me? No, it was a, a mix-up because he the scheduled speaker didn't show up, so they told him he could take the person's place, and then the person showed up, and so they said, well, he's here now, and so you have to leave the stage, and, which was very awkward and embarrassing to him. Later on, when they finally brought him back on stage, and I could see that he was not getting a good reception. I mean, this guy walked on stage carrying a toy wagon, a red child's wagon, piled two feet high with papers. And he said all of these papers document his amazing powers of psychokinesis, which I thought was fascinating. I like to read them. And, but the people in England thought of him as a clown. And so I got up and, and uh, spoke and said, I happen to know put off and Targ in California and how he ended the drought where he claimed to and the drought, it ended the way he said it would end, with UFO sightings and the newspapers announcing. So we became friends because I defended him in, in front of this hostile audience. That's wild. Is that who the PK Man book is about? Yeah. Yeah, I studied him for the next 10 years until he died, 11 years actually. He died in 1987. And the most remarkable event occurred that very year in 76, because uh, there were reports as I went through the files that he could produce UFOs. So I asked him to produce a UFO for me. And he said he would produce three uh, within a uh, hundred mile radius of San Francisco within 90 days. And uh, things were going well. We had a <clears throat> dramatic UFO sighting. Somebody in Concord, California, one of the suburbs, reported he, he was <laughs> walking uh, late at night uh, down the city street, and, and he got abducted and then released and re made, wow. filed a police report. And then I was on the phone with Ted Owens, and he told me, he said, Jeffrey, I can feel this coming. This is going to be a really big UFO sighting, one of the best ever. He said, this one is going to be witnessed by hundreds of people. It's going to be photographed, and the photograph will be published on the front page of one of your local newspapers. And Paul, this happened within three days. Wow. The uh, photograph was published on the front page of the Berkeley Gazette. And not only that, it was videotaped. And the videotape was shown on the Channel 9 Evening News in San Francisco. <clears throat> and it was seen both from the ground and the air because what happened was the art department at um, Sonoma State College, it's now Sonoma State University, uh, we're sponsoring an event with an uh, artist named Stephen Paleski, who was a pilot. And he had an airplane, and he was flying at 3,000 feet over the campus doing loop-de-loops with smoke trailing out of his airplane and creating designs in the air. That was his art form. Wow. So the whole campus is out there looking up at this airplane when a UFO appears right in his airspace. Oh wow, that, that's that, that, this is a this is amazing stuff and and for you to be witness to that and know that he's predicting this must have what did it do inside of you? Well, it was mind-blowing and and the problem I had thereafter was, you know, to try and explain this to my faculty members. Here I am, a doctoral student, and I've done this research and gotten this incredible result. And it sort of freaked out uh, my faculty members. I had one of them, a very well-known parapsychologist, resign from my doctoral committee after that event. It was like more than he could handle. Yes, 
And that brings up a very good point. Do you think the reason that we're not more conscious and aware of extraterrestrial interaction with us on Earth is because of exactly that? People could not handle it, so they blind themselves to it. And I'll back that up. You know, I don't remember which sailor it was. It might have been Captain James Cook. But they documented that whenever they approached native communities like on islands that had never seen ships or white men before, that nobody could see the ship except the shaman. They would be standing right there and wouldn't even see them. But the shaman would come tell them to get off the beach and he would be the one that would find out what the hell was going on because they had no concept in their mind for a floating vessel that large, so they couldn't actually even see it. So the point I'm making is the shaman, who is someone who's experienced it moving through multiple dimensions and it coming into contact with all sorts of things that couldn't be categorized by standard classical language and thought, could see it. And there's Jung thought that a lot of these uh UFOs had to do with our own subconscious and our own psychic functionings. Terence McKenna talked about it. So I'm wondering, do you think that maybe the reason that we're not seeing this, what's really going on or potentially going on is because of this exact blocking factor? Uh, very possibly. Uh, I uh, did my best to interest other scientists. At one time, I convened a scientific meeting. We had about a dozen people there, including J. Allen Hynek, and uh, as I recall, Jacques Vallée, well-known UFO researchers. And I remember distinctly Hynek saying, I wouldn't touch that guy with a 10-foot pole. And he said the reason in his mind was, this is a phenomenon of the subconscious mind, and the uh, subconscious mind is way too unpredictable for scientists to deal with. Dr. Mishlov, that brings up a question that I had for you. How would you define the subconscious? Because that's something that there's a lot of different opinions on and not much um, objective of evidence on. And how do you distinguish the subconscious from the unconscious? Well, Freud uh, really began the discussion of the subconscious mind. And uh, the Freudian subconscious has to do with all the things about ourselves that we don't want to look at. We have, you know, the id, ego, and the superego. And the superego uh, generally tells us that all of the impulses of the id, the aggressive and sexual drives that we have, are not socially acceptable. So we often pretend to ourselves that we don't have them. And then, according to Freud, they express themselves in dreams and in slips of the tongue and uh, in humor and uh, things like that. So that's one level of, of the subconscious. Uh, Jung took it a lot further, and he, he really introduced what I tend to think of as the superconscious mind, which is, you know, the collective knowledge of all of humanity is also in there. But if we're going to get to it, we have to acknowledge the Freudian subconscious, uh, or what Jung would call the shadow. We have to take a good hard look at our own shadow, then we can move past it and begin to enter into uh, the superconscious uh, aspects of our mind. Uh, now, you also referred to the unconscious, and that, that's an interesting term because it seems as if the boundary between what is conscious and what is not is, is always moving. It's as if uh, you know, um, Ken Wilber, as I recall, talked about something he called the Atman Project. And I, as I understand it, it's about bringing into consciousness everything that's not currently conscious. So we, we can uh, have access to anything. Uh, that's, that's what remote viewing tells us. Any, anything in time or space, or as in your experiences, even outside of time and space, can be brought into consciousness, but many things operate uh, normally, completely unconsciously. We breathe, 
uh, most of the time we're not conscious of our breathing at all, but it's still going on. Our heart is still beating. We're still digesting our food. But uh, I think it's pretty clear now that if we want to bring any of those functions into consciousness, we can do that. Yes. So you see, here's here's a sort of a a paradox about all this, and and I'm going to post it to you and and see where you want to take us with it. We're talking about the ego. The ego is often referred to as an idea plex because you can't have an ego without some form of enculturation or relationship. That's scientifically validated. Um, but the ego is a complex of ideas, and Jung spoke of complexes as a set of neurological or a set of emotionally charged associations that develop a personality or artificial intelligence all their own. But these are ideas and experiences. So everything that we're talking about depends on this thing called mind, which there's almost no reliable distinction of. And so how do you define the mind? And if you look at Larry ba Dossie's book, One Mind, he gives excellent evidence that we're all using one mind. You could call it the mind of the universe or the mind of God, if it, depending on what you think God is. But we, well, part of what I wanted to do with you in this interview is, is get, uh, get your opinion on some of these things. So what do you feel that the mind is? Well, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Larry Dossie's uh, work. I think uh, he, it's right on track. Um, in fact, he's something of a neighbor of mine here in New Mexico. He lives up the highway uh, from me. Great neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, he is a wonderful man. And oftentimes people get confused between the contents of the mind and the mind itself. In, in Buddhism, they talk about the mind as just sort of a, a clear, empty space. It, 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 you know, um, you could think of it as it's simply uh, awareness, pure awareness without any thoughts in it. And as you point out, the ego is a concept within the mind. Yes, it's an idea plex. Yes. I, I I would agree with that completely. We have an idea of ourselves, and sometimes we uh, we reify that. And, and in Buddhism, they talk about how uh, nothing is really real. Nothing is real in the sense of being permanent. Everything is transitory, and everything is conditional. Everything depends upon something else. Yes, exactly. They, um, they use the phrase mutually dependent arising things or co yeah codependent origination there you go and and so but aside from all the phenomena that appear within the mind all of which are relative and uh, never absolute the mind itself one might say is absolute but the pure mind is completely empty which is what the buddhists refer to as nirvana Right. Uh, the word nirvana technically means to blow out or extinguish. So that's, that's uh, I think you and I uh, have a similar picture. Well, it's interesting. Are you familiar with the with Dr. Daniel Siegel, MD, a uh, uh, psychiatrist? I don't think so. Oh, well, you'd love his work. He is probably the most dialed in psychiatrist I've ever studied in my life. He's written several excellent books and I've listened to many, many of his books on audio and read all of his books and studied his, his work extensively. And he, he explains something very interesting. He says, as a psychiatrist, I've been to countless conferences and lectures and education forums. And he said, everywhere I went, even in medical school, nobody could give a definition of what mind was. There, he said, I found it paradoxical as a psychiatrist that I'm studying a field that has no definition for the mind when it's a field of mind. So he got a team of about 40 people together that he thought were highly intelligent and capable of working with him to create a definition of mind. And his definition of mind, I think, is something you'd find interesting. Mind 
an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. So there's a lot, I've studied this quite a lot, and I've studied the Buddhist literature on the mind quite a lot and various Taoists and, and, and everything else. But one of the things that comes up pretty much consistently is that mind cannot function without polarity or duality. And so there's, oh, and the, and the Tai Chi symbol could actually be a beautiful uh, symbol of the mind. And uh, I, going back, I, I was watching a lecture by Nassim Harriman, who made a very good point. He said, the subconscious mind, according to Harriman's research, processes 30 billion billion bits of information a second. But the conscious mind, and this is, I've got physiology text verifying this particular fact, the conscious mind can only process about 10 to 100 bits of information per second. I have a German physiology text written in about, oh, probably 92 or 3 that stated that the human nervous system processes about 9 billion bits of information a second of which the conscious mind selects 10 to 100 bits, all of which are based on what it perceives as survival threats. So the interesting issue is that Harriman says what we call the, the subconscious mind is, is what we should really be referring to as the conscious mind because it's capable of managing 30 billion billion bits of information a second. It keeps you breathing and digesting and eliminating and functioning. And it's far more powerful than the conscious mind. Bruce Lipton says the unconscious is about a million times more powerful than the conscious mind. But having looked at lots and lots of different books and researchers' opinions on this, one of the things that is, is sort of inherent is that mind is actually a field of action and that our individual minds are often described like eddies in an ocean or a river, though you can have rose petals spinning around in a circle, moving down river, there's activity in one eddy that's completely different than what's going on in another eddy. So if we think of, of mind, as you say, like a field of awareness and our individual minds as <clears throat> the flow of energy and information through Anything that would be called a being, so like raw, would be an entity, but it's, it's not a physical entity, but it's a some kind of a being. So if we take everything from insects and microorganisms all the way to humans, dolphins, whales, and even uh, potentially any entity that has some sort of individual field of action, it seems that mind itself is full of minds. And I haven't really been able to ever find a better distinction for what's going on than that. But to, to kind of break that down, we have to get into things like what is the field of action? So, uh, you know, then, then you're getting up against issues of God, uh, which I'm curious. Well, sooner or what, later, you do have to uh, address the question of spirit. I think uh, the... the uh, question of speed is is really fascinating. You probably know of uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. I haven't read that one. No. Well, he he's looking at it in a very similar way. He talks about the logical mind, which is works slowly, versus the intuitive mind, which works very quickly. Uh, so, so it's a similar way of of looking at things. Uh, and there's also a fascinating study uh, that come to my attention, people who do research on psychedelic drugs, where they find that uh, people have these amazing psychedelic experiences where there's so much happening, so many colors and lights and states of consciousness and connections, and they would imagine that the brain must be very active when that happens. But it turns turns out the brain is actually less active. Less active. That's right. So it it suggests that the mind itself is outside of the brain, 
And, and the brain acts as a filter, keeping us from being overwhelmed by everything that's going on in the mind. Yes. Uh, I'm writing some notes while I'm listening to you. Uh, that's uh, very true. The current research on psychedelics, and by the way, as a in my work, I I, I have uh, done many, 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 literally hundreds of healing ceremonies using plant medicines, and I did a year of training with a doctor that uh, specialized in them, and then became part of the Native American Council, so I could uh, use uh, plant medicines under the uh, guidelines of a Native American Indian healing ceremony. So I have conducted uh, a lot of healing ceremonies and done a lot of my own research on myself using various plant medicines that have psychedelic properties. Uh, so I've explored this extensively myself. But the current research shows that psychedelic drugs, in, 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 you know, pretty much all of them do the same thing, but they're, you know, marijuana is a weak psychedelic, but something like LSD, uh, ayahuasca, psilocybin, all disable the default mode network, which is the network in the brain that creates our sense of self or ego and makes the ego structure very, very porous to the flow of information that we would call subconscious or unconscious, which is why so many people have these very, very profound experiences because they are basically their, their belief network is becoming disabled and therefore the filtration system gets to be much, much more porous and we're able to access information that's always there, but we're filtering it out without realizing it. Very interesting. Yes, I would agree. Now there's something else I want to share with you uh, in this regard, because uh, I think it's fascinating and you may, may or may not be aware of this. Are you aware that the, do you know what the Cray supercomputer is? Yes. Did you know the hard drive is made of water? No, I didn't know that. It is. And now some of the most advanced computer uh, companies in the world making the most high power computers are using water as the hard drives. And they were very perplexed as to how water could store so much information. And current research on water shows it has an almost infinite capacity to store information. So having looked at this research, and being very interested in this, I happened to be watching Greg Braden's series, Missing Links. And in one of his episodes, I think in the third series, he lo and behold brings up the information about water being used as hard drives on computers. He even shows pictures of these little tiny hard drives being made and how they process the water to make the hard drives. And he says, but the scientists were concerned about how water could hold so much information so they did extensive research, and guess what they found out? Uh, I, the, you tell me. The water is not storing the information. The water is interfacing with a field. They could not specifically identify where the field is, but it appears to be non-local. But the water is actually encoding Research on water says that water can remember every surface that's ever touched and any interaction that's ever had for the life of the water molecule, which, as you know, could be a very long time. But what the researchers found making these exotic computers was that the water was actually interfacing with a field that appears to be non-local. So the water's not actually memorizing mm -hmm. the information. It's interfacing with a field. And when you consider that our bodies are approximately 70% water... That turns out to be quite interesting, and it has a lot of implications for memory. It has a lot of implications for everything that we've been talking about, because if water is actually the intermediary between a field, which would classically be referred to as mind, it makes a lot of sense as to why we may have all these abilities that are uh, extra physical. In other words, the water is not storing it, it's tapping into a field. And if you look at research on quantum information processing, it's very, very likely that what we call the universe, or or if you want to go behind that and call it God or source, can actually zip all the information in the universe down to zero. Well, what an amazing story. This is something I was completely unaware of, and I have to think it also must be very 
related to homeopathy. Absolutely it is. Totally. You're dead right. What is the what is the homeopathy? It's a in alchemy, any liquid is a water, so we'll call it a water, even if it, it could be alcohol, it could be a number of liquids. But what are they doing? They're putting the vibration of the plant, the spirit of the plant, into a liquid medium, succussing it, reducing it, succussing it, reducing it. The paradox is the less atoms of the original plant, the stronger the medicine gets. But the most powerful homeopathics don't have a single atom of the original substance. So really what we're in the domain is energy and, and information. And since there's no atoms in there, then the water must be interfacing with some kind of a field of information that's linked to the intelligence of the plant that carries the information that helps the body regulate itself to heal. It, it's very interesting. It's food for thought. I know that there are uh, some very serious researchers looking at memory of water, but the idea that the water is interfacing with a another non-local field where the memory is uh, actually stored is a, a fascinating idea. I really uh, would be quite interested in looking into that further. You know, you might want to if you have access to Greg Braden, re re send him an email and ask him if he could uh, share the research that he shared in his series. I wish I could tell you exactly what episode was, but I've watched all three series and there's, you know, probably 40 episodes there. But it was in, I think I'm quite sure it was in the uh, last series on Gaia TV and all of them are fantastic. So <laughs> if you have to go through them to find it, it won't be that hard. Or you could get a hold of Gaia and, and ask them. They might be able to tell you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll see what I can find. So, uh, which brings us to a key question. How do you personally define consciousness? Well, you know, I don't really try to define it too much other, other than uh, uh, thinking that you really have to consider uh, consciousness from the personal level and then from uh, this larger sense, of, as Larry Dossie refers to, the one mind that embraces everything. And uh, I think you uh, pointed out earlier that the entire physical universe is sort of just a, a crystallization of that, that consciousness. Yes. What about the self? Are you familiar with the astrologist Dane, uh, I think it's Rudyard. In fact, I even interviewed Dane Rudyard on one occasion. Yes. Well, I've read a few of his books and I really find his approach to astrology quite fascinating. It's much more grounded and real than most astrology books I've read, which by the way, Rudolf Steiner developed an entire system of astrology called astrosophy. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I haven't uh, dug into that at all. I've got three books written by one of the key students of his that developed it even further, uh, and there are three probably 250-page books, all on Steiner's system of astrology, which is quite potent. You are a wealth of information, Paul. Well, you know... I have a lot of questions. I came to this world with a lot of questions that I couldn't get answers to. And I found, I studied Steiner's model of the soul and Steiner describes, first of all, Steiner defines a soul as anything with an inside and an outside all the way to an atom. So Steiner's model of the soul begins with the mineral soul evolves next to the biological soul. Then it goes to the intellectual soul. The next level is the awareness soul. Then is the, intu then, then is the creative soul. Then the intuitive soul. And then you come to what he calls spirit soul union, which is what the alchemist described as, as the ultimate, you know, enlightened state. But, one of the things that Steiner points out in his description of the awareness soul, he says that we all 
come to the point in the development, and I'm paraphrasing because it's been years since I read this work, but he, he comes, the ego is so full of ideas, but we all come to the awareness at some point in our lives that a lot of those ideas just aren't working out very well for us. And we have a tendency when we're young and in a developmental stage, just believe things as though they're true, like what our parents tell us, teachers tell us, churches tell us, etc. But he says, you will come to a point at which you either have to start asking bigger and better questions and investigating them for yourself, or you will not develop an awareness soul. You will stay stuck at the level of the intellectual soul. And interestingly, Carl Jung said intellectuals are people who are afraid of direct experience. And so what I found is I've come up against so many loggerheads trying to find definitions of mind, soul, God, almost everything you can think of in any field. Almost anywhere you go in any field, you'll find equally qualified experts diametrically opposed on any opinion which Steiner said is exactly the world's created that way to bring us to the point where we realize we have to start thinking for ourselves and become an individual or our soul will not grow. And so I'm just somebody who doesn't do well with checkmate situations where you have people on both sides of the fence and then nobody ever goes any further. You just choose a camp and then you got a belief system, but you don't really question was Jesus really a man or is this a myth? You know, that's, there's an example of a, of a, of honest question. That a lot of people don't ask. Um, and there's many of them. What is God, uh, et cetera. So I, I just found in my life that a, I had to get answers to these questions, which required a hell of a lot of study. And B, even after a lot of study, I could not, uh, get to a firm decision because I could still find equally qualified people opposing those opinions and I didn't have the knowledge to differentiate who was right or wrong. So ultimately that led me into asking my soul to guide me and help me figure these things out. And, and, and so there's many areas in my life where I just had to trust the wisdom that my soul's given me. And the reason that I do that is because my soul's shown me over and over again that when my soul's leading the way, I can find the answers to and create things to help people that my ego could never even have conceived of. In fact, when I paint, I try to let my soul paint. And I look at some of my paintings and go, there's no way I could have even painted that. I don't even know how that happened. It's like I went into a trance and, and my soul painted through me. So when you practice these kinds of things enough, I find, and I've taught this to a lot of people that have had the same experiences, you come to realize that um, you can't get answers from other people sometimes. You have to go deep enough into yourself to find a place that you have enough trust in what you're being given by whatever it be, God, soul, or otherwise, the universe, however you want to classify it. And only when you can verify those answers through legitimate life experience are you really in a place to trust that wisdom and then the challenge is no matter what you tell other people, they usually won't believe you anyhow, because what you're going to tell them is going to go against what all the experts say, and that's where their belief systems lie. Well, I think uh, you've got a lot of wisdom there. And, and the tricky thing about telling other people is they often have to discover it for themselves in any case. They, it's not enough that you tell them. And, and to make it even more complicated, everybody is different. You know, William James wrote uh, one of his last books was called a, a Pluralistic Universe, in which he, he said something very similar to what you're saying, which is, yes, there's one mind in the sense uh, that Larry Dossi writes about it, one uh, consciousness, but every person is a universe unto themselves, nonetheless. I agree. Yes, totally. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on what the soul is? Well, you you seem to have a much better handle on it uh, than I do. I, I think of the soul as, as sort of the... Um, the emotional nature, the, the longings, the drives, the, uh, the sense of direction. Gene Houston, my, one of my 
mentors in years past, a woman I admire enormously, uses the term entelechy, which is sort of that the the purpose that we come into this world with. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an interesting philosophical mm-hmm. argument. I've got a book on philosophical arguments about what God is and written by a compendium of philosophers. It's quite an interesting book. But in one of the arguments, they have this, and I want to share this with you because it relates to this conversation on the soul. You may know the argument. The argument goes like this. If a crew of sailors boards a ship, we'll call it the grace. The name of the ship would be Let's call it grace. And they do a long voyage around the world. And as they're journeying around the world, they hit many rough seas. And each time they have to go into port, they replace a piece of the ship from the hull to the rudder to the mast. When they get home, every single piece of the ship has been replaced except the nameplate on the back that says grace. The question is, is it still the same ship? That's a, a lovely story, and it's sort of symbolic of, of each of us. We replace every cell in our body every seven years. Well, actually, current research now says every one year we turn every cell in our body over every 365 days. It used to be believed it was seven years, so things like the bones and the teeth were thought to be slower. But either way, that it still does make the same point. So what I'm proposing is that grace is the soul and that every, sh- every single sailor on any of those ships, and I used to work on fishing boats, so I know what it's like to be out on the sea in a ship. We all relate to that ship. Even if we have a car and you replace part by part over 20 years, And 20 years later, you're driving the same car. You might have a name for it. I used to race cars, and I had a very intimate relationship with my cars. I became one with them in races. And it seems to me that the soul as an organizing principle would be the concept of the ship itself, but the wood would really be something that is embodying the concept just like einstein said the field is the sole governing agency of the particle therefore it's the field that's aggregating particles into stars moons planets asteroids and all the things that we call life including ourselves and that field would be what dossie would refer to as one mind so i i just feel that the soul is the organizing principle and i wanted to share that philosophical argument because it really kind of sets the stage really for us to question, well, what is the soul? And what is it that makes that ship grace, not, you know, the the mighty warrior or some other thing, right? But every sailor that returns on that ship will say, I sailed on the grace, no matter how many parts have been replaced. And they will always think of it as the grace, not any other ship. So. Because you're you, you because you've been interviewed so many people and and you've got a whole life of experience in these areas, I'm asking you these questions just because I'm really curious. You know, this is my only chance I've ever had to be able to talk to you personally, but I've developed a deep love and respect for all your work. So I thought, how much more fun could I have than <laughs> talking to Jeffrey Mishlove about these things? Well, I like uh, your definition. I think it's a, a perfectly good one. It seems to me that uh, we think of the spirit. Uh, And the soul, they get confused sometimes. And I I like to think of the spirit uh, the way Larry Dossie describes the one mind. It's eternal. It never dies. But I think the soul is a little different. The soul, at some point, is going to merge with the spirit, and it will become one with it and be eternal. But until then, it has a beginning and it has an end. It has a, a journey that it takes that's very unique to each of us and there's sort of a mystery if if we're all one why does it seem as if we're in different bodies we're in different life histories and uh, i think that the soul is a very important part of that mystery and in order to really understand it some of the things you've been hinting at like astrology 
or astrosophy, as, as the anthroposophists call it, uh, the study of archetypes, the study of mythology, all become very important in uh, getting a handle on the journey that each soul is going through. Well, you know, I asked, I asked my soul exactly that question that you've just mentioned. Why are there, if there's only one mind or one God, then why are there so many beings, uh, whether you say in the world or the universe? And my soul said to me, because if God did not create the illusion of separation, love would not be possible. And the truth is that God is love. Therefore, God creates the illusion of individuality or separation so that each of us, as a piece of God consciousness, can interact with other pieces of God, and through the actual experience of loving oneself and loving others, they come to realize what's behind the illusion, which is Unity, which is what all the great mystics have told us and exactly what I've experienced in my own mystical experiences. Because when you go deep enough into God, there's nothing but pure awareness and there is no duality. But the instant that you come out of that state, you're in a duality. And then here I am talking to a part of myself called Jeffrey Mishlove, and he's talking to a part of himself called Paul Check, which is allowing us to have this experience. And I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. And that's what we're doing right now. Well, I couldn't put it any better than that, Paul. I think you've stated it uh, very elegantly and succinctly. I... I'm really impressed uh, with all of your work and your your background knowledge, plus your experience on boats and on race cars and uh, <laughs> in in the military. You you really bring to your work a a very very broad uh, background, plus a, a very deep understanding of all of these things. So it's been a a great pleasure for me to uh, make your acquaintance. I'm delighted. Well, I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I have deep respect for you. I'm curious as we kind of wrap up here, uh, what do you feel the future of consciousness research and parapsychology research is in the next 10 to 50 years? What do you, what, what can we expect? Well, I, I don't know how long it's going to take before parapsychology is integrated into our mainstream academic institutions. It could happen quickly, like in the next 20 years, or it might take 600 years. Uh, I don't have, uh, I'm not a prophet in the sense that I can see uh, how how long it will take to happen, but I know it will happen. Yes. Now, here's my my last real question for you, because we've been at it for a while and I know you're ahead of us in time and I don't want to uh, burn you out because I'm very grateful for the time you've shared. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what message would you like to share right now with humanity? Uh, (laughs) It's been a great ride. I've enjoyed being here. Uh, Goodbye, everybody. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Good luck. (laughs) Oh, you know, um, somebody, you know where I got that idea from, uh, you know, Houston Smith, somebody I studied, I read all his books and I studied his work for years and I, you're familiar with Houston Smith. He was a good friend. Oh, I love him. You know, I I put a lot of time and study into his works and I just, he's like an angel to me. I I actually, in my prayers every morning, I I do a ceremonial uh, prayer prayer, uh, process each morning where I blow uh, smoke like like from a peace pipe. And uh, I have pictures of all the great minds that have informed my life and really enhanced my life. And David Bohm is one of them and many, many of them, but Houston Smith's one of them. But Toward the end of his life, actually, I think it was the last interview someone did with him before he died. They said, well, Houston, if you had a message for humanity, uh, knowing that you're going to be leaving the world soon, what would it be? 
And his message was, be a little kinder. Just be a little kinder to each other. Be kinder to the world. <laughs> and I thought that was so beautiful and so Houston Smith. Yeah, that, that was lovely. I once posed the same question to uh, Joseph Campbell. and Oh, wow. Uh, of course, you know what he would have said. Follow your bliss. <laughs> yes, yes. And I love in one of his lectures, he gives the etymology of the word bliss. And he says, what a lot of people don't realize is the word bliss actually comes from a root word that means pain. <laughs> he oh. said, so you have, you got to go through your pain to find the bliss or you'll never know you've got it. So, yeah, I have you know, to agree it, with that too. Yeah. I, I've had a fantastic time with you. Thank you so much for giving us this time. And, and, uh, I can't encourage you guys listening enough to check out Dr. Mishlove's new Thinking Aloud platform on YouTube. If you just go on YouTube and search new Thinking Aloud, it'll come right up. He's got a lot of fantastic interviews. And as I said in the beginning, Dr. Mishlove and his Thinking Aloud program uh, really has been the source of a lot of learning for me because I've watched countless videos of his presentations on uh, with very interesting and intelligent people. And I've bought the books of everybody that really struck me as somebody who I need to pay attention to and read piles of them. So it's been really amazing. Is, is And I mentioned your books at the beginning. Is there anything else that you would like to say or or anything that you would like to give as far as web addresses or anything that I've missed that you'd like to share? Uh, well, uh, let me just say that New Thinking Aloud, it's spelled A-L-L-O-W-E-D. Right. As opposed to what? A-L-O-U-D. Oh, you know, that's so funny because I spelt it. I'm, I, you know, I only have a ninth grade education. I left the school in the first three months of the 10th grade because I found school teachers were driving me nuts because they couldn't ask, answer any of my questions. And I didn't like it when I answered, asked them the questions. And so I went off into the world and became a father by the time I was 18 and uh, never looked back. But uh I always have spelled aloud the way you spell it for your show and thought that was how it was spelled. So how's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, for a fellow with a uh, ninth grade education, you're uh, amazingly smart. Uh, you uh, really demonstrated how uh, a self-educated person can achieve great heights. Well, thank you. I, I really just try to inspire people to trust in themselves and, and, uh, you know, follow their heart. I think the most important thing for all of us is to trust that if we do what we love to do in the world, that we will always be making love, even if we're not making money. And as a therapist, I've worked with lots of extremely wealthy people that are really sad and broken and don't enjoy their lives at all. But whenever I work with people like you that do what they love to do, they many of them don't have a lot of money, but boy, they they have abundance of 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 uh charisma of magnetism of of presence of the ability to connect and they're typically very open-minded people so you know i found that the people that inspired me the most were were people that really lived from their heart and uh i want to say thank you for for doing that because your career has added a lot of value to me and to many of my students well i'm i'm delighted to think that uh, i was even a small influence because uh you're a magnificent human being and and i feel honored to uh, have had this time with you paul and look forward thank you. to reconnecting with you Yes, I will follow up with you and uh, you've got my email. So I'll uh, get you some information. I'll share my alchemy with you. I'll share the painting I did with you and and uh, let's stay in touch. And if you ever feel like having a chat about something again or want to do another round, I think we could have some more great conversations together and, and uh, everybody else can go get some of your magic. I think one of the things that you do so well is bring us uh, exposure to people that really give us an opportunity to grow ourselves. And, and that's such a gift you've brought the world. I'd be very happy to do that. Well, thank you. And I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, thank you for any purchases you make with our sponsors. Any purchase you make with our sponsors supports me to keep the podcast alive and to do the research and the work 
necessary to make the podcast and to bring excellent people like Dr. Mishlove to you. And thank you all for sharing the love and for your own personal growth. And if you enjoyed the podcast today, please share it so that we can uh, get more people like Dr. Mishlove out to the world, because I think we all know we need to, uh, as Ken Wilber would say, wake up, clean up, grow up, and show up. And uh, there's no better way to do that than listening to wise people like Dr. Mishlove. So enjoy, everybody. Talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove. You can watch and listen to Jeffrey's New Thinking Aloud conversations on his YouTube channel at newthinkingaloud.com. That's N-E-W-T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G-A-L-L-O-W-E-D.com. Follow him on Facebook and Twitter at New Thinking Aloud and on Instagram at Jeffrey Mishlove. Join the discussion on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash groups forward slash 13860770 or on Discord at discord.gg forward slash VZU9HKK. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chakiva.com.